Good morning, and welcome to the DOS Box Info Center sa Senado, Volcano and Earthquake Webinar. Isang malagod na pagbati mula po sa DOS Box para po sa inyong lahat. And um, we would like to acknowledge all the participants from the various offices uh, within the Senate of the Philippines. Uh, maraming maraming salamat po sa inyong pagdalo ngayong umaga. And um, of course, um, ang mga kasama po natin mula sa DOSD office ni Secretary. Uh, this half-day webinar aims to provide information for a better understanding of the current DOSD FIVOX National Volcano and Earthquake Monitoring Programs and DRR innovations. And after several weeks of uh, coordination and preparation, we're finally doing it. And we did prepare five interesting topics very important for discussion this morning. And so, para po hindi na tayo matagal, for us to give a very important message this morning, we are very pleased to have with us and very happy that he uh, is able to uh, join us this morning. Let us all welcome uh, the Secretary of the Department of Science and Technology, Secretary Fortunato T. De La Pena. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Maganda po paga sa lahat. My warmest greetings. I'm Hi, really... Good morning. Good morning. Good morning po. Naririnig nyo na ako? Yes, yes sir. Yes, sir. Warmest greetings to everyone, to all our participants uh, from the Senate, uh, from the uh, uh, committees uh, who are represented, from the uh, Senate staff who are joining us. Of course, I am very pleased and happy to have this uh, series of uh, webinars uh, involving the different uh, programs of uh, DOST agencies. So we have been through something like this uh, regarding textile, regarding for, for, uh, forest products, uh, and other uh, uh, topics. Uh, today we are focusing on uh, the DOST P-Box uh, uh, webinar uh, entitled um, InfoBit sa Senado Volcano and Earthquake webinar. So we call this InfoBit because we are quite sure that uh, for a bit of information that you will hear from us, it will engage you to prepare for the, dis for the disasters even during this extraordinary time. This is a good opportunity for all of us to listen and also to give the OSTP box the opportunity to present its programs and initiatives that okay. mostly aims to help develop communities in our country to be safe and resilient to volcanic eruptions, to earthquakes, tsunamis, and other related hazards. Topics in this webinar will include earthquakes, tsunamis, and volcanoes, and how to prepare for these hazards, even during these extraordinary times. Ultimately, this webinar is believed to equip our Senate participants with a better understanding of the National Earthquake and Volcano Monitoring System and its significance to the disaster risk reduction. Our DOSTP work will also acquaint you with two of its smartest innovations and technologies First is the RADAS or the Rapid Earthquake Damage and Assessment Software, which uh, used to compute earthquake impacts in terms of uh, physical damage, casualties, and economic loss. The other one is the Hazard Hunter PH, which is a tool that can be used to identify the different geologic and meteorological hazards present in your area. It is a hazard assessment tool at your fingertips. I would like to emphasize that uh, disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation is uh, one of uh, uh, the big, biggest uh, programs that we have at the Department of Science and Technology. And um, uh, our uh, agencies uh, directly involved in this, uh, such as our Weather Bureau, PAGASA, our uh, Philippine Institute of Volcanology and Seismology, PBOX, and uh, also, our um, uh, Advanced Science and Technology Institute are, uh, are uh, very, very much involved and active in uh, developing systems that will help us uh, from uh, training people to developing apps to uh, 
uh, designing decision support systems during times of disaster. All of these are in our priority. In fact, I have uh, uh, announced to our DOST system that uh, in terms of the so-called needs uh, centers for research and development in the regions that we are uh, helping organize and uh, support uh, in the different regions of the country and in different areas or sectors, uh, I would like to see DRR uh, to be a um, DRR uh, and, and management, DRRM to be a uh, major area for these so-called needs uh, research centers. And uh, I'm sure that uh, many of our partner institution, mostly the uh, uh, state universities uh, will be able to come up okay, with uh, these uh, uh, desired uh, centers okay, that, that eventually will be national centers of uh, uh, excellence uh, in the fields that I have uh, mentioned. So we have had uh, many uh, needs research centers in the area of agriculture and biosciences that were uh, put up and supported during the last two years. Uh, we are starting to have uh, uh, needs research centers dealing with industry, energy, and the emerging technologies, and uh, also in health. And now I would like to see uh, needs research centers that uh, will help support our DRRM efforts. So I hope uh, that uh, we will continue to get the very, very, uh, shall we say, uh, uh, big support that we are getting from our Senate uh, in many ways. Okay, Of course, uh, legislation is the most important uh, thing, uh, but of course, sometimes uh, our Senate also helps us in our budgeting process. So maraming maraming salamat at uh, uh, maging productive na wa ang ating half day webinar na ito on the infobit uh, volcano and uh, earthquake uh, webinar. Marami pong salamat. Thank you. Maraming maraming salamat po, um, Secretary De La Peña. Now, let's move on uh, for a message. Representing the office of uh, Senator Binay, uh, Senator Nancy Binay, uh, who is the chair of the SNP committee, we have with us this morning uh, the legal counsel and policy advisor of uh, Senator Nancy Binay. Please let us welcome Attorney Risa Kalimag. Thank you. Uh, good morning, po sa lahat. Good morning, po Secretary De La Peña. Hi, Secretary good morning, Risa. Good morning, Attorney Reyes. Hi, good morning, Comsec. Uh, maraming salamat po sa pagdalo ng lahat. Uh, hindi po makakasama sa atin si Senator Nancy, pero nais niya pong ipaalam uh, sa inyo ang kanyang uh, warmest greetings po at pasasalamat sa inyong pagdalo. At meron po siyang mensahe na babasahin ko po. So ito po yung mensahe ni Senator Nancy. Magandang umaga po sa lahat. Uh, bilang chair ng Senate Committee on Science and Technology, kinalulugod ko po na makasama kayong lahat sa webinar na ito na pinamungunahan ng DOST at FIBOX. Napapanahon po ang webinar na ito dahil ayon mismo sa datos na inilabas ng FIBOX noong lunes, mananatiling nasa alert level 2 ang Bulkang Taal. And if there's something that we learned from the Taal volcanic activity last year, it is that having a sound policy in place is only a part of the formula for effective disaster prevention. I believe one of the things we need to focus on is to help the communities understand why these policies on disaster resilience and management are being implemented in the first place. Past disasters have taught us how sound policies like enforcing early and mandatory evacuation are rendered useless if the people do not see the need for such. Alam kong hindi nagkukulang ang FIVOX at DOST sa pagbibigay ng kanilang mga paalala at babala sa mga komunidad. Pero sadyang may mga taong hindi papansinin dahil hindi naman nila naiintindihan kung gaano katindi o kagrabe ang kanilang sitwasyon. However, even if certain communities do not yet see how these issues are relevant to them, it is still our responsibility to raise public awareness and make it resonate loudly and as far deep into the communities as possible. 
This webinar is a nice initiative from the DOST and FIVOX to keep the public informed on its latest programs and innovations and disaster resiliency. I believe this is a good entry point, especially for us in the Senate, to have a better understanding of risk-sensitive planning and resilience building during earthquakes and volcanic eruptions. Typhoons, earthquakes, and other natural hazards are inevitable, and it is up to us to build a safer, more resilient, and sustainable world for all. Muli, magandang umaga po sa lahat, and I wish you all a fruitful discussion. Thank you po. Hey, thank you very much. Salamat, Lisa. Thank you. Po, Sek. Maraming salamat, Attorney Kalimag. And uh, of course, the office ni uh, Senator Inay. Maraming salamat sa inyong lahat. Um, let us proceed. We prepared five important topics for you this morning. And ito po ay para lubusan po natin makilala ang uh, ano ang TVOX. At hindi lang po ano ang TVOX, para din po makita ninyo ang mga tao sa likod po ng ating siyensya. And so kasama po natin ngayon ang mga eksperto po mula sa TVOX at sana po ay... Uh, uh, makita ninyo kung ano yung mga current na ginagawa natin para po sa Pilipinas. So, um, let us uh, share the slide. Okay. Our first um, speaker for this morning uh, kilalang kilala naman po ng lahat. Uh, onting background, madalas po sa nakikita kung saan-saan sa TV, sa radyo, and lalo na sa social media. Um, ang amin pong uh, unang-unang uh, speaker for this morning, of course, is the uh, no other than our uh, Undersecretary for Department of Science and Technology and the OIC of EVOX. Uh, for a bit background, of course, he uh, received his uh, geology degree from the University of the Philippines, Diliman, and he... Uh, he received his master's degree in geological sciences from the University of Illinois in Chicago. And he has a PhD uh, in earth sciences from the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, University of California in San Diego. So please let us all welcome to talk about FIVOX priority programs, uh, USEC Renato U. Solidun Jr. Maraming salamat, Marilyn. Um, let me... First, share my slides. Maraming salamat po kay Sekboy, Teneriza, and all the participants for uh, lending us your time for us to explain what FIVOX is all about. No? Pero before we do that, gusto ko munang bigyan kayo ng background on what is happening in the Philippines and what are needed to make sure that uh, we not only live safely with these natural threats that we face, but most importantly, develop our communities safer and be resilient to the possible effects of these various natural hazards. The Philippines is ranked number eight among countries most exposed to hazards. And we all understand why this is so. The Philippines is part of the typhoon belt and we are prone to the effects of many weather and climate systems. Around 20 tropical cyclones pass through the Philippine area of responsibility. Strong wind would cause damages to agricultural crops and, of course, um, houses. Strong wind can also push waves to get higher and uh, develop into storm surges that would affect the coastal areas. And heavy rains can cause flooding and even landslide. And Filipinos prepare for uh, hydro meteorological and climate hazards, simply because these are most common. However, there are geologic events that would cause harm instantly and rapidly to many population and even cause significant damages in um, many places, not only a town, a province, or even across regions. And this can be the large earthquake events, large volcanic eruptions, and even the tsunami and other hazards that this would cause. Ongoing would be the global warming part of climate change. Uh, and right now we're in the uh, states where evidence would tell us that indeed 
the climate is warming up with around 0 0.1 degrees centigrade every 10 years. And these will exacerbate or amplify the hydrometeorological hazards, but would also cause certain geologic hazards to uh, have higher possibility of occurrence, like earthquake triggered landslides can be more devastating if the area has been uh, saturated with water because of rainfall. Um, soft ground can liquefy more if there are more uh, rainfall in an area. And of course, with sea level rise, the possibility of certain areas to be flooded by tsunami will also further encroach inland because of a higher start uh, of the sea level. And we know that uh, climate change would impact us in the long term, hundreds to even thousands of years, if I may say so, because we are really into the global warming phase of uh, a climate change, even without greenhouse gas emission. And this will affect various sectors of our society, even health and water supply. It is understandable that we all need globally to prepare for climate changes. But let me remind everyone that locally, regionally, within the country, a large scale geologic ha hazard like an earthquake or a large volcanic eruption can affect us more readily because this can cause immediate damages and loss of lives. So we need to prepare for all hazards and not forget the sudden onset geologic events. We have around 300 volcanoes, 24 are considered active, meaning these volcanoes have erupted historically in the past 10,000 years. Out of the 24 volcanoes, we monitor 10 volcanoes. We want to cover other volcanoes uh, with uh, additional support. And the reason why we focused on some of these volcanoes is simply because they have erupted recently and there are large population centers around it. Currently, we have uh, three volcanoes at alert level one, Pinatubo in central Luzon, Mayon Volcano in Albay, Canaan Volcano in Negros Island, and at alert level two, where the uh, unrest is quite significant at the Al Volcano, and we are closely monitoring this. The volcanoes, conditions, and how we monitor this will be explained later in another talk. Out of the eruptions of these volcanoes, we can see that uh, uh, the frequent eruptions occur in Mayon Volcano. And of course, second would be Taal Volcano, the last eruption of which occurred last year, and people are still threatened by the ongoing activity of Taal Volcano. Pinatubo Volcano is a volcano that uh, would explode violently, but the time in between the violent eruptions would be far in between, several hundreds of years, maybe 500 to 1,000 years. But in between these large explosions, we need to monitor the volcano for smaller eruptions that can still affect and or disrupt uh, economic and social mobility if in case there are some ashes. So what we need to do is constantly monitor these volcanoes and remind people of what is happening with these volcanoes so that they at the local level and the residents would prepare in advance and respond accordingly. In terms of earthquake events, the whole country is affected by earthquake except mainland Palawan. And this would be simply due to the fact that we are the only country in the world bounded by collision zones on both the eastern and western side of the archipelago. And as a result of the movement of the oceans or the seas, the, the rocks beneath this, where the Pacific side would move eastward, westward, the uh, South China Sea side would move eastward, the Philippines is considered like a big piece of rock being squeezed in several directions. And as a result, faults are developed. Where plates or blocks of rocks would tend to dive beneath the Philippine archipelago, we call those places where they dive trenches. And we can see in the east, we have the East Luzon and Philippine trenches. And on the west, we have the Manila, Negro Sulu, and Cotabato trenches. And in between, because of the forces acting on both sides, uh, many islands in the Philippines are traversed by cracks that move, and these are called the active faults. Notable will be the very long Philippine fault zone, which is the red line from Ilocos Norte to Mindanao, and other notable faults 
that are very close to urban areas, like the Valley Fault System in Greater Metro Manila area, the Cebu Fault System, which can affect the Cebu province, the Cotabata Fault System, which recently caused the series of earthquakes starting 2019 in Cotabato and Davao del Sur, and the Central Davao Fault System, which is found at the southern side of Davao City. Urban areas are more, more vulnerable to the impact of earthquake events because of the higher exposure due to number of population and buildings and, uh, and the concentration of economic, government, and uh, even financial operations. Recent earthquake events have shown us that earthquakes can devastate an area instantly. In 1968, a magnitude 7.3 earthquake occurred off in Kasiguro and Aurora and killed two people in Central Zone, but most of the people that died was in the Ruby Tower that collapsed in Binondo, Manila. We need to make sure that the building code is uh, really implemented so that areas that are not severely shaken, like what happened in Manila, will not see collapses of houses and buildings. In 1976, a magnitude 8.1 earthquake in the Moro Gulf triggered a tsunami within two to five minutes after the earthquake and caused tsunami as high as nine meters, and around 8,000 people died because of this. Of course, in 1990, most people would remember this, a magnitude 7.8 earthquake devastated Central Luzon, shook Manila, and killed 1,300 people. And this devastated also the Philippine economy. A series of earthquakes occurred after 2010, starting in Negros, Bohol, Surigao, Leyte, and lastly, the series of earthquakes in the Cotabato, the Vals, Dilsor area. If we all look at this, geologic disasters and even hydrometeorologic disasters, we can clearly see many damages and losses that we can account for. Let me just backtrack a little bit so that you appreciate the impact of these various natural hazards and the need to prepare uh, as a whole of society. These uh, damages and losses, I have underlined some of this, and these are the effects of the current COVID-19. We see life losses, we see diseases happening, we see loss or, in, or interruption of public and other critical services because of mobility restriction. And these have affected uh, supply of uh, materials and food. The transport system was affected because of mobility restriction. And overall, there was a loss of businesses, livelihood or loss of revenues from business interruption and these have disrupted our economic development. Mobility restriction and the need to quarantine caused displacement of people and disruption of our social function at the family, community, and even at the national level. However, if we now look at these various natural hazards, including geologic events like earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, or tsunami, the big difference of, would be the physical damages that this would cause. And this can also cause more death in an instance. And the long-term effect uh, will happen because of the physical damages to buildings. So we have seen the effect of COVID-19. But if we don't prepare for large-scale um, geologic events, we can see devastation of cities, regions, and even indirectly affect the whole Philippines, possibly, if, for example, the event or the disaster would happen in urban areas like Metro Manila. To really prepare for all of this, we need to achieve disaster resilience. And resilience is not simply being able to smile after a major disaster, but really focusing on three major goals. The first is to be able to reduce the potential losses or the risk even before the hazard would occur. Now this would include policy, implementation of policies like the building code, land use, making sure that communities are prepared. But all of this will need to have science-based information, monitoring and assessment of the potential hazards and the impacts, and how to understand and communicate the risk so that people, policy makers, will really do things appropriately. The second is to ensure effective and efficient disaster response. Therefore, we need to have our preparedness based on science informed scenarios. We need to prepare appropriately to the scale of the effect. I, I usually compare disasters 
and preparing for it like a boxing match. A large-scale earthquake in Greater Metro Manila, Metro Manila area is like we are facing a heavyweight opponent. Therefore, our preparedness should not be lightweight, but super heavyweight, so we can defeat and prepare better. So having a scenario-based preparedness to respond better is a must. And fortunately, this is not done so in many cases. But we have been convincing many people, and this will now be explained further in the uh, other presentation. And of course, if we're able to reduce the impact, reduce the potential losses in lives, then the effect of the disaster can be manageable so that we have a timely and efficient recovery. Where would DOST come in? DOST would come in mainly in reducing the risk by providing science-based information, but we also provide people guidance and tools and services so that they have an effective preparedness and response measure and even recovery measure. PVOX, as mentioned already in one of the video, focuses on earthquakes, tsunamis, volcanic eruptions, and related phenomena like landslides in terms of four major components. Hazards and risk assessment, monitoring, warning, and alerting, evaluation of the potential of large earthquake and volcanic eruptions from active faults and active volcanoes, and making sure that people understand the risk so that they prepare better. And we have a strategic plan to be one of the leading science and technology institutions all over the world, combining science, technology, and innovation to make communities safer and resilient to various hazards. And we have two major outcomes uh, to, uh, so that the society would be better prepared and resilient. The first is our external outcome. Enhance safety through empowerment of men and women in communities through five major strategic objectives to accurately predict and simulate geologic phenomena, provide highly accurate and timely warning, develop cost-effective monitoring and warning system, empower partners to lead in reducing risk. We cannot go down to all barangay. We need to empower partners and make sure that our efforts are further enhanced through collaboration at the community, local, national level, and even international level. Internally, we also have our strategic um, outcome of having a highly responsive and competent organization. We cannot do the external outcomes or objectives if we do not capacitate our staff and make our organization competent. And this we will do through highly prominent and globally recognized experts, motivated, rewarded, and competent staff, effective and efficient systems, and inspiring and dynamic leadership. To respond to all of this, we have crafted major strategic programs, and some of these will be explained to you. The first is a national volcano monitoring and warning that would address the first two, first three uh, objectives, the national earthquake monitoring and information, the national tsunami monitoring and early warning, the earthquake hazards assessment and R&D to accurately predict and simulate geologic phenomena before it happens, and aid in predicting which areas will be affected in case earthquake happens. And similarly, we do this for volcanoes. Our geologists would do volcano survey so that proper hazards assessment are done and to provide communities as guidance for their land use and even disaster response action plans. We have conceptualized a risk information management and development program so that we can assess the impacts of these hazards better and more importantly, share with you the information in a digitalized manner and a faster manner. We also have a very specific program on monitoring and providing warning for deep landslide events, which are more than three meters in depth. And lastly, we focus on understanding the risk and making sure that the risk is communicated at the local level through the volcano earthquake and tsunami disaster preparedness and risk reduction program. For the internal outcome, this would focus on human resources, developing leaders, making sure that we actually monitor and evaluate our performance. And a very important thing would be the ICT management that should be done and uh, employed in all our programs. And last would be the financial management and support. So in summary, we have all of these external outcomes shown in you. 
And I will explain to you how these are utilized in making our communities and our society resilient to disaster. The key actions for disaster resilience that we all need to have in the Philippines would be divided into four major actions. The first is know the hazards and the risks. What hazards will affect your place in the Senate, for example, property or businesses? What will be the severity of impact? Who will be affected? Second will be, are we able to monitor and forecast the triggering events of these hazards? And can we warn people or disseminate advanced information so that they understand the potential scenarios that can happen? Of course, responding properly and timely would be the major participation of everyone, especially at the National Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Councils down to the local level, down to the families and individual. But PVOX also would still be able to help people be guided on how to respond properly and timely. So to know the hazards and risk scenarios, the three major programs involved in this would be the earthquake hazards assessment, volcanic hazards assessment, and the risk information management and assessment. For your case, you need to know what hazards will affect your area. You need to study hazard maps. Second, you determine the possible damages and losses in your house or facility and surrounding areas. You should know the scenarios. For volcanoes, we have many hazards related to it. Typically, the rain of ash, the lava flow, which is not so dangerous. But the most dangerous hazard will be the pyroclastic density currents. The uh, movement at more than 60 kilometers per hour downslope or horizontally away from the eruption center. After the eruption or even during the eruption when there is heavy rain, loose volcanic deposits can be carried down as lahars. In terms of volcanic eruptions, just to give you a little bit of a background, there are two major types of volcanic eruptions, the phreatic or steam-driven explosion, and this is due to the contact of groundwater with hot rocks or magma. And these can produce short to tall columns and uh, deposited will be the previously erupted materials. And phreatic eruptions are precursory to magmatic eruption. Sometimes the magmatic eruption which will follow where magma would come up can, be, can immediately follow phreatic eruptions or may not, they may not follow in a little bit. The second type is the magmatic eruption and our volcanoes are monitored for these events. But magmatic eruptions are not only explosive. There are non-explosive eruptions where magma becomes lava flow during a non-explosive eruption. But we worry about explosive eruptions where magma is fragmented and expelled and produce eruption columns and generate pyroclastic density currents. In terms of earthquake events, um, there are various hazards related to it. The first thing that we need to avoid is the ground rupture or faulting when the fault, when it uh, breaks the surface, would displace or destroy anything on top of it. That's why many Filipinos wanted to know what faults are, where faults are, not because we are a fault-finding society, but because we want to avoid building directly on top of it. But the real hazard for an earthquake event is the ground shaking, because now it can cascade into many other hazards. During the shaking, soft ground can liquefy, behaves like a quicksand. There can be landslide in steep slopes. There can be fire during and after the earthquake. While if the earthquake is offshore or near shore, and the ground is lifted up or there is a landslide event, tsunamis can be generated. So people need to understand what these hazards are. So simply a ground rupture is produced when a fault breaks the surface and this can be associated with greater than magnitude six earthquake events. The rupture can be a few kilometers to hundreds of kilometers, and it can displace the ground sideways or vertically up or down. What we want to do is avoid building directly on top of it. The major hazard is the ground shaking. It can be an up and down motion and a, a rocking motion after the up and down for after a few seconds, which can be felt, especially if you're uh, near the epicenter. And these can cause damages to house buildings and other infrastructure. And even if the structure do not collapse, things inside might topple down or fall on people. During the strong ground shaking, loose water rich sediments behave like liquid during the shaking. And sediments will be arranged in a more compact state. And because of this, 
process, buildings that are not properly constructed will subside or tilt, builds foundations can subside, and roads can be fissured. Hence, liquefaction areas need to be identified because you cannot use your four-wheel vehicles immediately after an earthquake when this happens. Landslides are, of course, understandable during heavy rains, but can also be a very uh, dangerous hazard during an earthquake event. For example, in the 2019, uh, 2012 earthquake in Negros, 50 people died because they were buried uh, by a landslide mass. Tsunamis are a concern for the Philippines because we are an archipelagic country. And many of our tsunamis have been generated by uh, the movement of trenches offshore associated with earthquake events or some landslides. We have volcanic tsunamis in Taal Volcano uh, that uh, also need to be protected, uh, the, the communities need to prepare for. However, because this is not so great as those in the ocean, if they evacuate the shorelines in Taal, they are already safe from volcanic tsunami. So what do we do at FIVOX? Our geologists and other scientists and engineers, for example, will do go to the field and map where the faults are, where the active volcanoes are, and determine through deposits and through the features that they see on the ground and through modeling what hazards can affect different areas. So we have been producing hazard maps. We also produce hazard maps through modeling and develop scenarios. For example, if a magnitude 7 point earthquake would occur in Metro Manila, those in yellow and red would suffer from an intensity eight shaking, like what is shown in this video on the right, where you cannot stand anymore and significant number of houses and buildings can collapse. The Philippines, as mentioned, can be affected by tsunamis. All of our shorelines can be affected by local tsunamis due to fault movement as, uh, associated, of course, would be the earthquake events and some landslides. However, those on the eastern side would have additional threat from distant tsunami or what we call tsunamis coming from other countries. Around 14 million Filipinos live in coastal areas that can be affected by a tsunami. For example, if a magnitude 8.3 earthquake would occur in the Manila Trends, this would enter the Manila Bay and would reach Manila, uh, Metro Manila political shoreline uh, in just more than an hour. And I just mentioned it because Senate is there and you will be part of the inundation area, which can be two to three kilometers inland with the height of a um, given the normal level of around five and a half meters maximum. To determine how uh, the potential impacts will be for earthquake, for tsunami, and of course you can do this also for flood and strong wind, we have developed this rapid earthquake damage assessment system, originally intended for earthquake, but can be used for other hazards. This will be explained later in more detail. For a better appreciation, of everyone, whether you go to one place, you want to know the hazards in your office or your house, you can do this at using your fingertips, using your phone or computer in less than one minute. And that is through the Hazard Hunter Philippines app. In this slide, I have zoomed in, I, I uh, googled, you can actually search for the place or zoom in if you know the, the area. You double tap the screen and I've uh, selected send it. And it will give you a summary assessment in uh, less than 30 seconds if your internet speed is good. And it will tell you which hazard you need to prepare for because it will be shown as red. Those in black will be safe. No? So for example, if there's an earthquake, it says there's a, it is eight kilometers away from the valley fault system, safe from ground rupture because it's not on top of the fault, but it is prone to intensity eight earthquake where you cannot stand anymore. It is highly prone to liquefaction, and if uh, there will be a tsunami from entering Manila Bay, you can be flooded up to three meters high. In terms of flood, you're prone to flooding less than one meter. And if you want to know the detailed recommendation and assessment, you can tap the green button there with view report with recommendation, and all the assessments will be shared with you uh, uh, through a PDF and uh, barcoded uh, assessment. Now, everything can be done in one minute. This will be explained again uh, later in more detail. In terms of monitoring and warning, there will be two presentations focused on the National 
volcano monitoring and warning, and earthquake and tsunami. And uh, I'll just mention landslide monitoring. But for your side, what do you need to do? You, you need to know the warning and alert for volcanoes, earthquakes, tsunami, and landslides. What hazards will affect your area? You need to monitor PVOX website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter. And then more importantly, determine the appropriate response corresponding to the warning or alert. Uh, in summary, we have 108 station net network for earthquake monitoring for now. We can also monitor earthquakes globally as we get data via internet, the raw data from different seismic stations. We have around 34 sea level monitoring stations with 10 communities with siren for warning. And we monitor 10 active volcanoes in near real time with uh, six volcanoes with integrated multi-parameter monitoring. Ms. Mariton Bornas will explain about the volcano monitoring, and Mr. Ismail Narag will talk about the earthquake and tsunami monitoring. Just in passing, I'll tell you that we have a specialized program to monitor deep landslides in 50 sites all over the country, where we have dug borehole, and for every meter of the hole, we try to sense not only the soil moisture, but whether the ground is moving at that depth. Information I directly shared via SMS messages to the communities that will be affected by the disaster. And the communities, on the other hand, would monitor their surrounding. And they're very actively involved in this operation because they are the ones that will die if there will be a landslide in their area. Most importantly, people, local government, and up to the national government should prepare and respond properly and timely. And this week, we assist um, through the Volcano Earthquake and Tsunami Disaster Preparedness and Risk Reduction Program. On your side, you need, you need to know what to do to prepare, to respond, and reduce the possible impacts of hazard before, during, and after a geologic event. You need to engage your family, your organization, your office mates, and community to collectively prepare. So we have three major messages when we talk about preparedness. Preparedness should mean that you are in a safe place. You don't build directly on top of a fault. You need to know the hazards and follow appropriate regulations, which need to be implemented at the local level. We also need to make sure that we have safe construction practices, using right materials, right design, and the right workmanship. We cannot do away with these three. We need to follow the building code, which needs to be improved. It's already outdated, and we need to upgrade it. For those with up to two-story concrete hollow block houses, we develop a how safe is my house questionnaire so that you can develop an assessment for your house if you're okay with an earthquake or not. The third is, is very important as well. Even if you have in, you are in a safer place, you have a safe construction, but there are other impacts of the disaster. Therefore, we need to have safe community, organization, family, and individual. We need to develop plans which are appropriate to the hazard scenario, making sure that you test those plans by participating in either tabletop or drills. This needs to be done at all levels of society. Most importantly, we need to collectively prepare. We need to have our community, school, or organization prepare for various hazards, for earthquakes and for tsunami, for example, and also for volcanoes in areas in front of active volcanoes. In tsunami-prone areas, we need to st study the hazard maps, know areas that are unsafe for tsunami, and know which areas are safe where, where you can evacuate to. We need to prepare evacuation, evacuation plans, install signage so that we know which areas are safe and unsafe, and we need to test drills. Guidelines have been prepared by PVOX, and these are available. We produce many information materials. We actually study, do research in the community so that we can appropriately produce materials that are appropriate uh, to their community or to their uh, level of understanding. We have a lot of capacity building, to empower our partners at the local level, organizations, the media. We have significant teachers training and of course communities. So in summary, we are prone to many natural hazards, climate change, and even the pandemic and we need to live safely with these hazards. And our focus would be on monitoring and warning, hazards and risk assessment, to provide appropriate science-based scenarios 
so that the public prepare better in accordance with these scenarios. So thank you for your attendance and listening. I, I'm also thankful for the continued support of the Senate for making sure that our budget is increased. <laughs> Uh, and uh, I implore everyone, and not only you, but also everyone in your family and your community, for, for all of us to work together to make your families, your communities safe and resilient to disasters. Everyone plays a major role. Let me ask, le let me leave you with this question. Given this information, can you ask yourself, are you preparing? Are you preparing with the right scenario? Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, News Actually Boom. Maraming salamat po. Uh, for questions, uh, kindly, if you would like to post your questions in the chat box so that we can read later, we will have a separate question and answer portion uh, after all the talks um, later. Uh, but just for a few reminders, admin to, no? uh, as requested by the Secretariat, they've been posting the link to the attendance. Kindly uh, fill out the Google Sheet so that we can have um, attendance for those who are with us this morning. Kasi po, we will be uh, giving out certificates uh, for this uh, webinar, uh, but there will be a feedback link also later at the end of uh, the webinar. And uh, first of all, we would like to acknowledge also the presence of uh, Ms. Dita Suerte, uh, Felipe, uh, from the OSD po. Uh, she's the one, uh, her office uh, is part of you nag initiate po ng activity natin this morning. Maraming salamat po, Ma'am Liz, uh, Ma'am Vita. Uh, good to see you again. Um, okay, so let's uh, proceed. Our next speaker, uh, as what the uh, Yusek Solido mentioned, she is uh, currently the uh, chief of the Volcano Monitoring and Eruption Prediction Division. I think familiar na rin po ang muka dahil po last year, uh, parati niyo siyang nakikita. And she's a geologist. Uh, she received her uh, uh, geology degree from the University of the Philippines. And uh, she took her master's degree from, uh, in Earth and Planetary Science, Hokkaido University in Sapporo, Japan. And she's currently working on her PhD uh, in the University of uh, uh, in Valjun. Uh, Please let us all welcome uh, the Chief Science Research Specialist uh, of Volcano Monitoring and Eruption Prediction Division, Ms. Maria Antonia Barnes. Good morning, Mariton. Good morning, ma'am. Hello, good morning po sa lahat. Good morning po uh, to our beloved Secretary, Adela Peña, uh, to all of the members and uh, uh, the members of the Senate. It's a pleasure and a privilege to be sharing with you today. Uh, the topic of the National Volcano Monitoring and Warning System and National Volcano Monitoring and Warning Program, which I uh, uh, ha uh, administer for the uh, DOST fee box. No? So, um, it turn off ko lang po sandali yung aking uh, video just so that we can have uh, the full advantage of our internet. No? So, uh, as you know, last year, Taal volcano erupted, and this really posed a lot of uh, questions to uh, many communities uh, surrounding the volcano in terms of their preparedness. No? And um, uh, currently, as our secretary, uh, undersecretary has mentioned, Al has been at uh, um, frequent uh, unrest, and we have raised the alert level last March 9 because of uh, seismic uh, activity. So, so our program, the National Volcano Monitoring and Warning Program, actually answers. Sorry, I'm not. Uh, the National Volcano Monitoring Warning Program answers to the strategic objectives that were discussed a while ago by you, Sexually Do. Uh, uh, first and foremost, to provide highly and accurate, timely volcano information and warning, uh, especially if the volcano is going to erupt, if, if a volcano is going to erupt, to accurately, accurately predict and simulate volca volcano uh, eruption phenomena, and to develop cost-effective monitoring and warning systems 
for the effective and efficient monitoring of our active volcanoes. And so this uh, strategic objectives answer to the program, uh, program objective of timely uh, warning and accurate prediction of volcanic unrest based on high quality volcano monitoring data. And these are uh, our outputs so that we can achieve these objectives is provide volcano monitoring services and information to our stakeholders for efficient and effective 24 seven monitoring operations. Uh, to provide uh, to uh, implement state of the art networks instrumentations processes and data systems in order to support the acquisition of high fidelity volcano monitoring data and to uh, uh, produce short to long term assessment of volcanic unrest and analysis of volcanic processes through the regular generation of applied research of high quality volcano monitoring data now as uh, you sexually mentioned, the Philippines is home to 300 active volcanoes, 24 of which are active. And 10 of uh, these active volcanoes are actually already monitored. We have Pinatubo, Taal, uh, the Bicol volcanoes, Mayon, Bulusan, Isarog, and Iriga, Kanlaon, Hibok Hibok, and Matutum Parker volcanoes. I hope I didn't forget anything now. So, so how do we classify uh, the uh, status of a volcano? When we say that a volcano is active, it means that it has erupted within historical time. So in terms of the Philippines, that would be the last 600 years. Now, so ibang bansa, for example, in Japan, that would be in the last 4,000 years. And of course, in the Middle East, that would be in the last 7,000 years. Now, if a volcano has erupted any time, in the Holocene, this is the, uh, in the past 12,000 years no, after the last ice age, and or has volcanic seismicity, then that volcano will also be classified as active. So how do we uh, determine if a volcano has erupted in the Holocene period before the, pre, the pre, uh, sorry, before the historical period is uh, through geologic studies of uh, the deposits of the volcano. Now, if you do not have all of this information, but we see that a volcano is uh, young looking, no? the landform is young, it's not uh, very weathered, it looks like one of our active volcanoes, then that volcano is potentially active. So in this map, the, uh, the active volcanoes, as you can see, are highlighted in red, and then the potentially active volcanoes are the ones that are highlighted in uh, closed green triangles. And then we have the inactive volcanoes. These are uh, volcanoes with no recorded eruption. So practically, uh, well, almost all of uh, the mountains of the Philippines, save for a few, are actually or were once uh, active volcanoes. No? So most of these uh, mountains are already inactive. Uh, they have uh, ceased activity for a long period of time. And, it, that, and that uh, period can be seen or is evident from too much weathering of the mountains and there is so much erosion and there are deep gullies and uh, deep valleys. And essentially there is no uh, indication that the slopes of the volcano has been rejuvenated by a recent eruption. Okay, so when a volcano prepares to erupt, uh, if you look at the uh, uh, cross section of a volcano, you will have the what is called the magma chamber beneath the volcano. No? So this is an example. Not all of ma not all magma chambers look like this. Uh, some of them are actually like flat sheets or uh, standing uh, tables. No, and some of them are uh, uh, round rounded masses. But uh, this is an idealized uh, picture. No, so beneath the volcano you have magma that is crystallizing and while it is crystallizing it is uh, degassing so uh, when uh, during quiescence we will still have monitored uh, activity or activity from the volcano we will have the occasional earthquake and then we will have uh, some of the volcanic gases that are seeping through uh, the layers of the volcano uh, dissolve in the crater lakes or in the springs that are issuing from the ground. No? But when magma is preparing to ascend uh, the volcanic flank or the volcanic vent in preparation for an eruption, then we will have an increase in seismic activity. And that is what is happening right now in Taal. No? So 
oh, when uh, this happens, there are rocks that are broken and the gases are beginning to uh, effuse a lot from the magma. So this is in the form of when the magma is deep, that's carbon dioxide. But when the magma uh, shallows, then it will release more sulfur dioxide. And uh, all of these changes will be reflected in the surface through the uh, acidification or the rise in temperature of hot springs and uh, main uh, crater lakes. And we will have increased seismic activity as well. Uh, the ground will swell and uh, gravity, the gravity uh, or the density of the volcano will change and the electromagnetic field of the volcano will also change. And then uh, at the surface, we may already see some indications of impending activity. We might see uh, a crater glow or uh, yeah, increased uh, venting of steam from the crater. And then, of course, when magma has finally broken through, all of the rocks are uh, stopping it from coming out of the volcano, then we will have an eruption and we will see the kind of seismic activity that we saw last year. So it's almost continuous earthquake activity because of magma pulsing through the volcanic system and coming out uh, at the top or at the mouth of the volcano. So when a volcano also prepares to erupt, the ground deforms. So here uh, in the picture, we can see the magma trying to push up the volcano. And uh, this here are called tilt meter stations, uh, which are uh, stations that are designed to measure or uh, record the tilt of the ground. And then uh, to the right are uh, called uh, benchmarks or GPS stations, which are uh, stations uh, designed to measure vertical and horizontal displacement. So when the volcano is about to erupt, it will push the edifice or its edifice or its landform up. And this changes, uh, we cannot see the, the change uh, most of the time. So the changes are imperceptible, but they can be recorded by our instruments. So the tilt uh, increases, so the ground tilt, so this can be recorded by our instruments. And also the distances and elevations between our benchmarks or our stations change. So this is what we also measure when the volcano is preparing to erupt. So the typical precursors of an impending eruption include increase in frequency and strength of earthquakes or quakes with felt uh, events and rumbling sounds. We have ground inflation or swelling, uh, ground fissuring, as we have seen in Taal, changes in the rock density around the volcano, increase in the carbon dioxide and sulfur dioxide degassing, uh, increase in caldera or crater lake uh, or fumarole or hot spring temperature and acidity, we will have crater glow like, like what we see frequently in Mayon. Fish chaos if you have a crater lake and drying up of vegetation and phreatic eruptions or increased steaming in craters. Now we have, uh, uh, in order to catch all of these precursors, we undertake different types of monitoring. We uh, undertake seismic and infrasound monitoring, ground deformation monitoring, gravity and an electromagnetic monitoring geochemical monitoring and visual monitoring. So the National Volcano Monitoring and Warning Program is essentially an integrated, uh, integra are, is essentially integrated strategies for indirect measurement. Kasi hindi natin nakikita yung magma, it's not like the weather systems uh, that are uh, ravaging us, no? nakikita natin yung, yung bagyo pagpalapit sa atin. But the magma, we really can't see. So all of the strategies are indirect, for the measurement of the condition of the volcano's magmatic system for eruption prediction. So we have uh, uh, what are called multi-parameter techniques for monitoring the volcanoes. So the National Volcano Monitoring Warning Program has eight continuing projects. Uh, one, uh, our main or core project is for dedicated for managing and operating our seven volcano observatories which uh, have to be always uh, developed in terms of their volcano network. So we have a dedicated uh, project for that as well, the NESDEF. And then we undertake our core monitoring and research 
uh, work through uh, three uh, projects, the ground deformation monitoring, geochemical monitoring, and I'm uh, sorry, four, and uh, uh, seismic infrasound monitoring and gravity and electromagnetic monitoring uh, of our active volcano. Uh, active volcanoes. And so the wealth of information that is produced, that are produced by our volcano monitoring networks and systems are all handled uh, through the development of a database. So when all of the data are processed, all of the data are committed to the volcano database uh, system. And we have a special project for the Bicol volcanoes, which are the highest, highly active volcanoes of the Philippines, the highest, uh, the, the most active volcanoes of the Philippines. They have the highest uh, activity of all the active volcanoes. Okay, so uh, our volcano observatories and networks are designed for on-site monitoring of our active uh, volcanoes. And uh, we have a physical station, a physical observatory located in the environs of uh, our uh, most active volcanoes where uh, our uh, staff conduct all of the frontline monitoring services, have uh, engaged with the community, and they are essentially the information resource for, the, for their own areas of responsibilities. So we have eight staff volcano observatories uh, for every active volcano, but we also have two or are an, an additional one in Canlaon uh, volcano. So we have eight. Uh, we are uh, uh, an observatory in uh, General Santos City is actually a seismic observatory, which doubles us up as a volcano observatory. Now, uh, all of these observatories are taking care or are central to seven volcano networks with real-time data acquisition. Uh, these networks, uh, Sorry, yeah, no, 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 no. but uh, this is the updated list uh, at the bottom. Uh, these networks actually are home to, uh, or handle 80 seismic and repeater stations uh, for infrasound uh, sensors, 32 continuous GPS, elect 11 electronic fields, 6 gas systems, 6 hydromet systems, 17 IP camera systems, and 8 all-weather stations. Now, this, is, uh, this is just shows you the distribution of our volcano observatories. So our oldest observatory uh, right now uh, uh, was, uh, well, right now physically is the volcano observatory, but our, uh, we have a new observatory for Hibok Hibok Volcano Observatory, but the oldest uh, structure that we have is actually beside the new observatory of Hibok Hibok uh, uh, Volcano Observatory. And um, all of these are functioning as the centers for information, both for volcano and earthquake in their own areas of responsibility. Uh, this is just a map to show you what our volcano monitoring network looks like. So these symbols that are colored green and brown here are our physical stations. So they are mainly seismic stations that sometimes double up as infrasound stations or uh, continuous GPS stations. All of these uh, stations are communica communicating data or data. As you can see the lines here, these are lines of communication to repeater stations, such as the one here we have in Tagaytay station. Uh, and uh, this uh, data are all uh, transmitted back to the Volcano Observatory, which is uh, uh, located in uh, Talisay, Batangas. We also have uh, this uh, symbol here. Uh, these are GPS stations uh, designed for uh, monitoring ground deformation. And uh, previous to the eruption of Taal, we used to have electromagnetic stations on the island. Now we have uh, field station, uh, electronic field stations as well here. And here uh, we cannot see, no? uh, Name. So before the eruption of Taal, we had more stations around uh, the uh, volcano. So this is a typical setup of a volcano monitoring station. In Taal right now, we have 12 uh, working uh, seismic stations plus one repeater station. Now, 
For our other monitored active volcanoes, this, these are our other uh, volcano networks. Uh, Mayon, uh, as you can see, uh, the net network is very, very uh, well developed. Uh, also for Canlaon Volcano, uh, Bulusan Volcano, at Pinatubo, Matutong Parker, and Hibok-Hibok Volcano. So uh, right now we are still uh, developing all of, our, all, all of the uh, necessary uh, station that will be uh, needed for accurate location and uh, determination of earthquakes around our active volcano. So currently we are developing more uh, around Pinatubo volcano. In fact, when uh, Pinatubo entered activity or unrest last March, we were actually building you know, or uh, refurbishing, uh, building and refurbishing some of our old stations. Okay. So what does a, a seismic station look like in the field? This is, this is our current uh, deployment or our current design for our station. We will have a shelter inside of which will be a vault about a meter and a half or two meters deep. And uh, the station will have a fence uh, to protect it and a tower mass for the, the communications. So inside the uh, vault, installed are the seismometers so these are uh, installed on isolated piers so that uh, it will be uh, protected from any kind of ground vibration so this is the old station design of some of our networks so these are our types of sensors sensors that are put inside the vaults uh, we're using kinematic kinematics brand of instrumentation and these are very expensive instruments and um, as in, in our old stations, they used to be buried uh, buried in a lot of dirt. So uh, in order to protect them from noise, but our new station design is already in place so that we can have easy access to our uh, instrument if uh, troubleshooting is needed. So the data that they are collected by the sensors are passed up to the digitizers. These are the sensors that Trans, uh, translate uh, electronic or digital data to uh, actual waveform or seismic uh, data. And uh, as we can see here, in Pulay Pula, no? and here the, the gray colored uh, boxes. And the digitizers uh, uh, communicate the data to the radios. Uh, these are spread spectrum transceiver radios operating at 5.2 gigahertz frequencies, which then transmit the data to the volcano observatory, so nag-uusap yung mga radyo, and uh, the data are processed in the observatory and transmitted to the FIVOX main office using VSAT communications, uh, wireless, uh, uh, inter uh, sorry, uh, uh, DSL, and uh, VPN networks. Okay. Uh, just a picture of one of our most recent stations. This is uh, the first borehole seismic station. Uh, installed in Batangas uh, province in the city of Tanawan. And this was commissioned in December of 2018. So the instrument is a borehole uh, instrument, Mahabasha, and it's installed at 20 meters depth of uh, this borehole. Now, our, our uh, seismic stations, uh, the investment that we have done through uh, this past decade to improve our seismic uh, stations have uh, borne fruit by providing us really high resolution seismic data through which we can actually recognize and uh, document uh, magma processes that were previously unknown. And it allowed, uh, the data has allowed us to illuminate the magma delivery systems uh, uh, for our active volcano so that we can actually understand what was going, what's going on beneath our volcano. So these are uh, the, the dots that you can see that are uh, getting uh, that are animating or plotting are actually volcanic volcano tectonic and hybrid earthquakes that occurred during the 2020 eruption of the Al volcano and this earthquakes actually illuminated the path of a magmatic dike that uh, uh, provided uh, or supplied magma to the Al volcano island uh, from a deeper source of Balayan or beneath the Taal Caldera of Balayan Bay. So the magma actually traveled from a deeper source at around uh, at, um, uh, deeper than 15 kilometers 
and uh, passed through or beneath the Pancipit River Valley and uh, was uh, came up of uh, came out of volcano island and erupted in january and this process also produced the intensive fishing that was experienced by several municipalities along the path of this magmatic dike we have been able to uh, uh we uh, the eruption last year happens very quickly as you can see before uh, the eruption, there was practically no, there was a period of real quiet. And this is a record of uh, a seismic record uh, from a station on Taal Volcano Island on its southeast flanks. And as we can see, there were only a few minor earthquakes prior to the uh, uh, start of seismic activity, which actually began at uh, eight o'clock, uh, sorry, at 11 o'clock in the morning. So this is a uh, UTC time, so plus eight. So makikita natin, we can see that earthquake activity actually started at around 11. No? So there were a few volcanic earthquakes. And then at one o'clock, suddenly the volcano uh, uh, started erupting. No? And uh, this actually was captured by our seismic data. And it, as you can see, the uh, uh this area here that is already already uh, blued and redded up are actually earthquakes no patong patong na earthquake events so they are like these earthquakes but they are larger and they are uh, uh coming in uh, rapid succession so halos hindi na makita yung record but uh, we, we can see from our borehole station the uh, events and we can also see from our station in Bamban Tarlac monitoring Pinatubo volcano, the seismic activity, you know, the eruption. So uh, we have recorded uh, the eruption of the Al across a uh, large portion of Luzon Island. Uh, and this is a, a result of our uh, improvements. Now, our high resolution seismic data are uh, also able uh, to provide us uh, some insights into the kinds of uh, uh, earthquakes that are occurring uh, during eruptive activities, and especially if we are uh, if the data are paired with other multi-parameter monitoring data, for example, IP camera systems, then we have an effective way of understanding uh, what the precursory activity of the volcano is. For example, for the uh, in uh, December 2017, Kanlaon erupted. But before this, there were six uh, volcano tectonic earthquakes recorded within the 24 hour period before the eruption. So this is the eruption here. And as we can see, the plume, uh, the, the volcano spewed out a five kilometer high eruption column, which is mostly composed of steam. And we can see the uh, uh, eruption in the seismic record. So this uh, blue. Uh, figures here are the waveform or the signal from the eruption. Uh, they are corresponded by these uh, colored regions here. This is called the frequency spectra. They're essentially, just uh, how uh, fast the the volcano is um, uh, responding to the uh, event or so shaking. No, so we can see. Uh, this red uh, areas over here are actually concentrations of energy uh, versus the frequency. So uh, the frequency is in hertz. So it, for a for a, a seismic event or an earthquake event, we can see if the uh, most of the shaking is slow or most of the shaking is very high, and that we can actually classify what kind of material or what kind of uh, medium is causing that uh, uh, incident or that uh, earthquake. Okay. Now, for example, recently we raised alert level in Pinatubo volcano. These dots over here are the earthquakes that have been recorded, a total of 540 as of yesterday. And we can see that these earthquakes are actually are located very deep uh, beneath the volcano at mostly 10 to uh, 30 kilometers deep. You know? And uh, these uh, earthquakes are actually volcano tectonic or tectonic earthquakes. 
And we understand that because they are tectonic earthquakes or volcano tectonic earthquakes, that magma is not involved in this activity as of yet. So because of the kind of earthquake data that we get, we can actually see if magma or no magma is involved in the activity. Okay. So uh, in contrast to Pinatubo, for Taal, we see a lot of uh, uh, involvement of the magma in the current uh, activity in the form of low frequency uh, earthquakes, volcanic tremor, and some hybrid events. So this uh, map over here are plots in Kulaira. These are plots of the earthquake, uh, volcanic earthquakes that are occurring, uh, that have been occurring on uh, Volcano Island and its environment. And as you can see, most of the earthquakes are actually plotting uh, above two kilometers. So very shallow. Uh, uh, these earthquakes are quite shallow. And we can see from the signal, if you can, uh, these are the types of the signals that are produced. So we have volcanic tremor here, and then low frequency volcanic earthquakes, and then hybrid earthquakes. We can see that the low frequency contents of these earthquakes actually correspond to the movement of fluids. And because of the very shallow uh, seismicity or uh, plots of these earthquakes, we know that these fluids are probably volcanic gases or hydrothermal fluids, that steam and uh, hydrothermal water that are being uh, uh, that are being driven by magma, the gassing at depth. No? So there's probably magma deeper than these earthquakes that is the gassing, the gassing quite profusely and producing all of this activity right now at Tal Volcano Island. Now, so uh, for monitoring ground deformation, we undertake uh, both continuous and campaign GPS monitoring. Our GPS stations are typically co-located with our seismic station. This, so this is a bare bones installation that we have, for example, for a station in Canlaon Volcano where the GPS station is mounted on uh, the roof of the shelter. Uh, in some of our active volcanoes, we have uh, a worldwide standard of uh, installing the GPS receiver on a uh, well-designed pole or mast, you know, like here that we have in uh, Mayon Volcano. And then in some places, our receivers or our GPS stations are co-located in government offices. For example, this is one with, that we have in Batangas. No? I think this is in Laurel um, Municipal Hall. Then we also conduct campaign GPS to augment our continuous uh, GPS uh, stations. So what does uh, GPS data do for us? Well, GPS data actually illuminates how a large portion of the volcano is moving. For example, uh, the map that you see here is a map of the pre-eruption ground deformation or st uh, station velocity of the GPS station. So these names here correspond to GPS station and the arrows are actually station velocities and uh, based on uh, the scale here and uh, the where they are pointing at is where they are moving. So we can see that the arrows are all moving away from Taal Volcano Island. And that means that something is trying to push up, uh, up the volcano. And that is why the ground or the stations are moving away from the volcano island. Uh, the data here on the right, as you can see, uh, the, are called baselines data. They are uh, measurements of the station distances, the interstation distances. So for example, this is DHTN to LREL. So that's DHTN to LREL. So every year, uh, so the continuous, uh, the, the, the uh, the stations are giving out their coordinates continuously so we can estimate the baselines between two stations and as we can see in uh, before the 2020 eruption there was actually deformation in the order of uh, less than uh, 15 centimeters in our stations and uh, after the eruption uh, during the eruption some of the stations actually bounced up as we can see from the baseline data, and some of our stations actually subsided. So uh, here we can see uh, 
DHTN to VTBC. So these are the Caldera stations. And then DHTN to VTBM. VTBM is a GPS station on Tal Volcano Island. And we can see that the uh, here the base lines actually move down. So pag dag move down, ibig sabihin bumagsak. Pag dag move up, ibig sabihin uh, umakyat. So there was sudden deformation during the eruption of uh, approximately one meter. No? So and and uh, actually more no uh, for uh, volcano island. So as we can see here, uh, that's uh, again uh, BLLE to Duhatan. That's BLLE to Duhatan. So essentially, ang nangyari. So the northern part of the caldera actually bounced up, rebounded up, and Volcano Island to the south and southern portions of the caldera actually uh, went down. No? And uh, if, uh, if you look at the charts at the bottom, this is data or the station uh, height of uh, uh, the station VTBM here to the left and station LREL to the right. So you can see the behavior of the station. So VTBM on Volcano Island dropped down and uh, Laurel on the caldera went up. So this is how we see the or how a GPS data illuminates deformation in our volcanoes. Now, to augment um, our monitoring of ground deformation, because GPS has a very wide a very wide coverage of the volcano on the flanks or near the, the source itself sometimes if the uh, if the gps networks are too far apart they, it cannot um, detect uh, the deformation when it the volcano is about to erupt now so as a, a complementary strategy uh, 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 volcano monitoring networks install tilt stations, electronic tilt stations, this, which measure, measure rotational ground deformation on the uh, uh, nearest the volcanic uh, crater or the volcanic center. Uh, in Taal, before the eruption, we have three uh, such stations and uh, two of these stations survived. No? So one was completely uh, damaged or actually fell off the main crater. So, ito yung itsura. This is what uh, installed in Taal Volcano Island. Uh, borehole tilt meter. It's installed at five meters depth inside a vault. And the station is, uh, well, uh, I failed to mention the seismic stations. Or uh, our stations or our remote stations are powered by solar energy. You know? So, FIVOX has been probably one of the oldest users of solar energy in the Philippines. So, we've been using uh, solar power since the 1990s. Uh, so this is the current uh, type of instrument that we are using for tilt uh, monitoring. To the left, to the right, these are uh, you can see what are called platform tilt stations. They don't need to be uh, put quite deep in the ground. All we need is a good platform. And they also actually mesh, uh, they also measure uh, ground deformation uh, uh, tilt uh, tilt uh, uh, on the volcano, but uh, these uh, stations are very prone to noise. Or these instruments are quite prone to noise, unlike yung borehole uh, tilt uh, meters. But ang, ang advantage niya is this is very easy to install, but uh, uh, borehole tilt meters are very difficult to install because it requires us uh, boring a deep borehole, uh, putting in a deep borehole for the instruments. Okay, so what does uh, Electronic tilt data show us it shows us near vent deformation. So what, how the uh, volcano actually deforms when it is about to erupt. Uh, here uh, on the left uh, is uh, our data from our uh, stations, electronic tilt stations uh, on Taal Volcano Island before it erupt, uh, erupted in January 12. And as you can see, there was practically no tilt. No, so yung kulay green uh, dots, these are uh, the component moving, uh, uh, the ground uh, behavior or the ground motion going north. So if, it's, if it goes up, it goes north. If it goes down, it goes south. No? And then the blue uh, dots are actually the component of ground tilt going to the east or west. So if it moves up, it goes to the east. If 
it's, if it moves down, it goes to the west. So as you can see, just prior, just at the onset of the eruption in 2012, suddenly the uh, volcano island started to violently or abruptly and very rapidly move uh, tilt to the southeast. But then uh, as, uh, in this uh, data here at the lowermost uh, uh, profiles, the station actually suddenly shifted uh, direction and suddenly violently moved to the northwest. So what happened was this station actually uh, almost fell off the main crater. And then the data is cut because the volcano already erupted. So we can see that uh, uh, in this uh, data set that unfortunately we did not see the, the magma coming through uh, or coming up uh, in incrementally in the edifice. So what this tells us is that magma really just uh, very rapidly ascended to uh, the main crater. And uh, so the uh, deformation registered uh, was regis uh, recorded just right during the eruption or the onset of eruption. To, uh, to the right, we can see here just uh, modeling of the volume or the uh, source of the deformation. And uh, the, this information actually helped us uh, during the eruption to assess uh, how the activity is going to progress. So during that time, the tilt information provided, provided us a rough estimate that the volume of magma included beneath uh, was roughly half of a million cubic meters. Not much. No? Hindi yung kinakatakutan na malaking volume like uh, in the 1754 or the 1911 eruption probably. No? Okay. Now we also have other campaign methods for monitoring our volcanoes. Uh, we uh, employ long-range EDM and precise leveling. These are geodetic techniques which require our field uh, engineers and scientists to perform a survey along established benchmarks on the slopes of the volcano. Uh, here on the left is an example of a survey during the eruption of Mayan in 2018. And here we can see uh, the instruments that are used. These are called uh, EDM, electronic distance um, measurement uh, instruments, or total stations or uh, the modern, mass, uh, modern combination of the total station and the EDM, which we are using now. Here uh, we can see what are called reflectors. They are installed on the volcanic slope. So here we have uh, on the uh, top here, a uh, uh, reflector installed on the slopes of Mayon Volcano on the Southeast sector. And this white pole here is a reflector installed at 1,800 meters above sea level on Tandaon Volcano. And every day, our staff at the observatory reads off the distance between the observatory and these reflectors every day, no? at, in the very early in the morning. So we are trying to see if the distance between our uh, station or our benchmark in the observatory and these reflectors are changing. And that if the, there are changes, or for example, if the distances are getting longer or getting shorter, then the volcano is actually deflating or inflating respectively. We also have a, a real-time gas or physical chemical stations on our volcanoes. And here we can see some of our pioneering stations in Taal Volcano. We had the first continuous dissolved uh, carbon dioxide station in the world in uh, Taal Volcano before it erupted. No? So of course, ngayon, wala na si Rana yan. Uh, this was in collaboration with a partner from uh, Belgium. We also had a multi-gas station in the crater that was already also erupted, but it provided us very in, uh, important information about what happened before uh, to, uh, to the uh, magma before uh, the eruption. In Mayon, we have continuous uh, sulfur dioxide measurement. And we also have a borehole carbon dioxide station in Mayon, although this has not provided us really uh, 
Good day, Ben. We also conduct uh, campaign gas flux and physical chemical surveys. Uh, you can see here uh, in, uh, what we report, uh, carbon dioxide flux and sulfur dioxide flux are actually measured by campaign methods. No? So for carbon dioxide, we measure uh, at data points around the lake. And for uh, sulfur dioxide, we use a campaign method to transect the plume no? so that we can get a good uh, profile of the sulfur dioxide. Uh, some of the data that has been uh, provide that has been provided by gas uh, and uh, other uh, types of uh, geochemical surveys have actually been been very helpful uh, for assessing our the status of our volcanoes. For example, uh, yeah, uh, Taal was uh, recently raised to alert level. No, uh, in February we provided or we issued an advisory, and then last uh, March 10 we issued uh, March 9 we raised alert level because the lake was actually acidifying uh, uh, th that is uh, shown here with the uh, uh, data on the ph uh, 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 progressively decreasing uh, from last year and then we have increased sulfur dioxide emission this march which is actually comparable to the period just right after the eruption last year then in contrast, for Pinatubo volcano, when we raised the alert level and we've had a seismic, uh, increased seismic activity uh, under the volcano, uh, our CO2 data showed us that there is actually no cause for fear because the, uh, the CO2 being emitted from the um, volcan uh, volcanic crater is actually very low. No? It's within background level. So mas mataas pa before and it's not actually increasing. So there is no indication that deep magma is actually trying to come up because if the if deep magma is trying to come up pinatubo crater then we will see a rise in the carbon dioxide okay and then we have real-time ip camera systems uh, being uh, that are monitor monitoring, monitoring our activities as well uh, together with our observers so that we can actually have a real-time view of what is happening in our volcano so this is a uh, main uh, uh, IP camera uh, video of the Almain crater eruption last January. No? So we are able to see how the eruption actually progresses from the vent. Sorry. Uh, our IP camera monitoring has also provided us very important information on the eruption. Uh, eruption plume characteristics that we have been able to provide are uh, a lot of uh, stakeholders so that uh, for their safekeeping. So that this is um, uh, some of the monitoring data from our IP cameras uh, during the 2018 eruption of Mayon. And we are also able to use this information to tie this with the seismic activity and to understand what the seismic data is telling us uh, by comparing or, or by tying it with the IP camera data. Okay. And we are also uh, undertaking other forms of geophysical surveys in our active volcanoes. We're measuring the changes in the gravity using very high precision gravimeters and uh, the change in the electromagnetic uh, uh, field around our, our volcanoes. So we are employing very high precision geophysics. So I ko not kita yung data dito. So, so I have to wrap up now. So the public can actually access our volcano monitoring data using our website. Uh, these are processed volcano monitoring data. Uh, we have uploaded those that are older than uh, three or four years ago, three, older than three or four years now, so that the so that our uh, many stakeholders, particularly among researchers, not in the mga estudiante or uh, other. Uh, people or enthusiasts of volcano monitoring can actually use the data for their own needs or for their own researches. Now, how do we implement our warning information? We use the alert level criteria and we use the six step no, or five step uh, uh, excluding zero. So zero is normal. And uh, as uh, based on the monitoring parameters that we are seeing, if there are increases in uh, an unrest in the volcano, we will raise alert level. So, may mga criteria ito uh, based on um, our monitoring parameters. 
and then each uh, criteria are, and are uh, interpreted uh, based on uh, what the volcano is doing and what uh, the public needs to do you know, or how the public is supposed to behave. So at alert level three, uh, most of the uh, active volcanoes, permanent danger zone and high hazard zones have to be evacuated. So may mga volcanoes tayo na may mga PDZ, and then may mga volcanoes tayo na meron lang silang danger zones or high hazard zones. And these are typically, yung high hazard zones are the areas that are susceptible or prone to yung pyroclastic density currents na, na worst case. At alert level four, uh, we should be evacuating uh, communities that will be threatened by the worst case scenario, which is at alert level five. Okay, our information is actually conveyed uh, through a, a protocol no? and uh, our information has to be sent to the Office of Civil Defense, the Office of the President and the DOSC Secretary. We also provide what is called a Volcano Observer Observatory Notification for Aviation to the uh, CAAP, PAGASA and the Volcanic Ash Advisory Centers in Tokyo and Darwin. And we provide an eruption bulletin for the general public. Now, yung EN and VONA, uh, we have to release this within 10 minutes no, of the eruption. Uh, this is just a, a map of the jurisdictions of the Volcanic Ash Advisory Centers. And as you can see, the Philippines is actually divided between two. So we have to report to uh, Tokyo VAA for eruptions above uh, north of Tanlaon Volcano, and then to Vaak Darwin uh, for eruptions south of Tanlaon Volcano. So, pag ang Tanlaon ang nag erupt we have to report to both. You know? And these are just this is just a summary of the eruptions that we've had in the past decade. So, we've had uh, ten eruptions, I think, uh, thir thirteen. Uh, sorry, thirteen eruptions in the past decades. So our future plans is we we, uh, we are currently in the works for, uh, for installing an electronic tilt array in the southeast of Mayan. We are also have we also have to commission already constructed stations on Canlaon, Abulusan, and Pinatubo volcano for uh, borehole seismic stations. Uh, uh, sorry, Canlaon uh, and Bulusan borehole seismic stations, and we are constructing one uh, this year for Pinatubo. And we are planning to uh, install uh, new borehole seismic stations in Mayon and Matutu Park. Eh? And then we are increasing our network coverage and we'll be installing single seismic stations in Mount Apo this year and in Kagua and Biliran volcanoes in 2023. And uh, we are adding uh, ground deformation monitoring to Pinatubo. Uh, this is what's supposed to be next, next year, but we have to expedite it this year because of activity. Hibok Hibok and Matutum Parker in the future. Uh, we are also going to be developing gas stations and additional uh, uh, other stations. And of course, yung continuous uh, monitor, monitoring station maintenance and upgrading natin, hindi na po yan nawawala. So every year we are trying to request instruments and other equipment so that we can replace or are, are already decrepit or uh, 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 damaged or uh, very uh, uh, old uh, instruments na wala na pong uh, support no? or uh, technical support or uh, nagmamalfunction na. Okay. Okay, that's all. So thank you very much. Pasensya na po medyo. Uh, I'm, uh, uh, I, I hope na naiintindihan uh, uh, everyone learned uh, a lot from my talk. And if you have any questions later na lang na. So I'm currently at home uh, and um, uh, so medyo Medyo magulo po yung aking presentation, I'm sure. Uh, medyo maingay yung background. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mariton. Uh, Marami salamat. You, okay, uh, that is very comprehensive. But now we need to proceed um, to our next speaker. He is... Uh, he is the... This time, he's the captain of our Seismological Observation and Earthquake Prediction Division. He uh, received his ma BS Mathematics from the University of the Philippines. And of course, his expertise is seismology, um, seismic hazard and risk assessment, and numerical modeling of tsunami. 
Uh, let us all welcome uh, Mr. Ishmael Narad. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, sandali lang, let me share my PowerPoint. Okay, uh, so I will be talking about uh, yung overview of the present system operated by the OSTV Vox for monitoring earthquakes and tsunami events that may affect the Philippines. So I guess I don't have to mention but anymore that uh, earthquake is, uh, the Philippines is, is an earthquake prone country. No? So basically uh, what we see in, in the setting of the Philippines is actually a car crash between two plates uh, two plates on both sides of the Philippines and what we are witnessing in terms of earthquake events are like yung mga cracks nung car crash collision. So uh, uh, so these collisional features are actually shown as trenches as mentioned before and this is contributing to the uh, many many earthquakes occurring at the sides of the Philippines as well as yung uh, events occurring in the middle part of the of the Philippines where faulting is located in the middle part. No? So basically, uh, yung archipelag archipelagic setting of the Philippines is actually very suitable for tsunami generation because you have water. No? So we understand that whenever a er shallow earthquake, uh, seated earthquake occur in the oceans, this may displace the ocean floor and this will generate waves that propagate in all directions that may inundate coastlines and shoreline population centers in the Philippines. So right now, the Philippines has had 40 accounts of tsunami events in the past 400 years. Now, so based on uh, in the book that is shown in the right side of this slide. No? So with this, it's very important to monitor and understand the occurrences of earthquake events so that we can ensure that all communities are safe to all of the hazards that it will produce. No? So early this year, we had an earthquake na magnitude 6.1 located in Davao del Sur. This caused damages in the provinces of Davao del Sur and Cotabato region. Uh, as shown in the image on the right side, um, it shows the recorded ground motion by our instruments. And uh, basically the ground motion uh, data is used to determine the basic parameters of an earthquake, such as the, the actual time of the event, where it is located, which is the epicenter, what is its uh, depth, no? so the hypocenter, and also the magnitude, which is a measure of the strength of the earthquake in terms of the energy release during an event. Uh, the location of the earthquake or the epicenter is also expressed in terms of its distance from a known known reference site. In this case, it is Magsaysay Davao del Sur. So it is about five kilometers southwest of Magsaysay Davao del Sur. So uh, basically our institute is actually guided by two strategic initiatives, the National Earthquake Monitoring and Information and the National Tsunami Monitoring and Early Warning. No, so, and this is are supported by other strategic initiatives. No? So uh, this initiative provide direction in the development of the monitoring, monitoring resources of the Philippine government managed by our institute. No? So uh, it provides, yung first na initiative, it provides as a framework where we develop earthquake monitoring backbone of the country so that it can provide uh, critical earthquake information to the public. So right now we have around 108 uh, earthquake monitoring stations uh, located in, uh, managed by our division and also the one mentioned by Ms. Mariton a while ago. And in the international code, uh, this is this is referred to as PV in the International Registry of uh, Seismic Stations. No? So right now we have around 112 stations operating. So, uh, and, uh, uh, sorry, 108 stations and we plan by, by the end of 2021, we plan to commission about four more additional stations located in Tarlac, Batangas, Burias Island, Iloilo. We are also surveying and negotiating sites for um, possible remote stations to be uh, constructed in 2022. And uh, so basically by the time uh, 
uh, President Duterte steps down, uh, we expect to have commissioned around 115 seismic stations in pre-identified sites in the Philippines. So the image on the right side shows you a Christmas tree look of where the stations are located. No? And the stars will be, are the expected locations of the stations to be constructed and commissioned for 2021. So uh, in right now, uh, the, the core strategy is to establish remote stations wherein we construct uh, seismic vaults and lots that are negotiated for its use for earthquake monitoring. Normally, the local government uh, will provide us uh, through an agreement with them uh, where we can construct our seismic stations. And then after that, we can now perform civil works to establish a vault and antenna pole and uh, come out with a security perimeter fence and a signage indicating that this is a uh, uh, an earthquake monitoring stations. So uh, inside the vault, we would uh, install of the instruments, including a seismometer, a sensor attached to the ground, and there is a digital recorder and a timing system. So uh, these are all powered by solar panels and batteries, and it does not relate to the power grid. And it has a satellite data communication system that uh, transmits data to the uh, data receiving center in the main office. So when we say commission, it does not mean an inauguration. So although uh, certain milestone numbers are often points where we celebrate uh, our achievements. No? So uh, when we say a commission station, it would mean that the sens sensors are responding accurately and correctly. Uh, they are transmitting without affecting other groups using the same satellite service. And uh, it gets registered in the International Registry of Seismographic Stations, maintained by the International Seismological Commission and of the World Data Centers. So uh, this image shows the um, registered station in the Laguete Cebu. You can see the image of the uh, satellite antenna and also the vault and also the sensor inside the vault no? and also the uh, uh, solar panels on top of the vault. And uh, these are the information provided to the registry. So you can uh, see the it highlights also the contribution in the global registry of uh, seismic picks for earthquakes. Uh, so after after commissioning, uh, we uh, what we want is actually to uh, register. After registering all of the events, uh, it gets it gets into the data receiving centers located currently in the FIVOX building located in, U in UP Diliman. No? Uh, aside from that, we also have a Tagaytay mirror station with, which mimics the monitoring uh, setup in our data receiving center in, in UP Diliman. So if something happens to, to our center in the data receiving center in, in UP, uh, normally Tagaytay mirror station would take over the monitoring work. But we already realized that uh, just in case the big one will occur, it will also affect not only our stations that are the buildings, but also the, the infrastructure systems that support the, the operations of these uh, centers. So uh, we decided to establish two more clusters that would also mimic the, the operational setup uh, currently by the two uh, stations in, uh, inside the the compound of the Philippine Science High School in Mintal, Davao City, uh, which we plan to inaugurate uh, this year, and also another one in, in the Visayas region located in Cebu province. Um, what you see here is the uh, way of us de detecting the performance of how much uh, earthquake the the network can be capable to locate. No? So every time a station is commissioned, a circle whose distance of detectability is calculated is uh, colored inside the map. No? So as, as circles intersect, uh, the color changes to a hotter color. So we try to understand that the hotter the color, the greater number of stations uh, uh, can detect the event. And this will result to a better approximation or a more accurate location of the earthquake. No? So uh, this will show us what, how, much, uh, how much number of earthquakes can we uh, locate uh, per magnitude range. As you can see, there are still some gaps for events as small as magnitude, uh, events smaller than magnitude two. No? So why do we need to uh, detect uh, magnitude magnitude two events. No, so take for example the Valley Fault system. The Valley Fault system has not moved for 
several years. No? So uh, we do not display any earthquake activity uh, located inside Metro Manila. So, but time to time, it will also produce some activity. And uh, recently, last March 15, there was an earthquake that was located uh, very near Pasig City. No? So its magnitude is only 1.1. 1 .1, no? So uh, this happens to be the second instrumentally recorded earthquake inside Metro Manila. No? So there are several, initially there were four seismic stations that recorded the event, but eventually this was uh, further improved by additional stations that, uh, that entered into the system, uh, which later uh, improved the accuracy of the location and also the magnitude of the event. So uh, in terms of comparison with earthquake monitoring, you can also find earthquake data about uh, the Philippines in other regions. Now, for example, the US Geological Survey will also uh, publish their own location of earthquake events located in the Philippines. But just as in terms of comparison, this is just uh, uh, showing you the number of events located uh, for about seven days no? uh, for the period, I think, February. I think February. No? So you can see that the total number of events located in the Philippines is only 13. When we look at it in the, uh, the seismicity map for the same period, we would, uh, our network would have uh, recorded around 179 events uh, in different areas of the Philippines. So this is a richer, uh, richer number of earthquakes. And this could help us in doing uh, understanding what is happening uh, along the earthquake generators in different parts of the world. No? So uh, what do um, earthquake information, uh, what kind of help will this earthquake information do? So normally we would produce summary reports of earthquake events uh, happening so that it can aid us in making decisions. No? So uh, this is just a summary report of what happened during the pandemic. No? So I mean the time when we declared uh, MECQ and ECQ. And uh, this was very critical because uh, some of, while protocols were still being ironed out, we cannot we cannot actually uh, do maintenance and maintenance work at that time, and yet we were able to record many events uh, during the the two month that particular two month period, and uh, the magnitude range uh, ranges from magnitude one to magnitude six point six, and there were many many events that were located uh, during that time. Around three hundred twenty one felt earthquake events were were recorded. Uh, we also produce information products once we are able to uh, complete all of the information from the stations. And uh, we publish them as seismicity maps and reviewed earthquake catalogs. And we also uh, issue event certifications whenever it is needed, uh, especially during uh, insurance claims. And, uh, and uh, sometimes the insurance company would also request a similar certification so, the, so that they could compare it with uh, the with, uh, in insured, uh, insured uh, claimant. No? So uh, so some of the, the earthquake information can also be used for uh, planning purposes and it can would also use for uh, land use planning. No? So sometimes for investment planning. No? So uh, long-term uh, data is needed to understand what is the risk of investment also in terms of where to position all of the uh, residential and critical uh, critical uh, buildings in an area. No? Uh, some some uh, some products are often regularly you know, regularly uh, requested. So uh, right now we have uh, we have uh, produced a subscription scheme for those who would like to always request our, our, or regularly request the same maps and catalogs on a national regional scale. No? So if uh, an LGU would want, normally there are, are those who subscribe are from the local government and they would use this in coming up with their regular reports to their, to their, uh, to their mayors now. So, Shempre, often large events will occur, and this will require us to provide a much more regular update on the aftershock activity. Uh, this is often done so that uh, responders, especially those exposed to the direct hazards such as damaged buildings and areas with uh, potential for landslides, they are updated to the extent and the strength of the aftershock activity in the region. So, this is a map showing you uh, what kind of uh, updates are provided to to the public and the uh, the different uh, requesters of the information. 
uh, also, uh, earthquake information provides opportunities to understand the science of earthquakes. So, uh, FIVOX support research activity by publicly publishing our monitoring results at our website. So, can you can visit visit our website and you can see uh, all of our monitoring data uh, provided at our website now. So aside from the usual instruments that I mentioned a while ago, we also have a network of intensity meters. No? So when we say intensity, it means it is a numerical measure of the effect of an earthquake in an area. So this will hinge on descriptions of how people behaved, how objects moved, how buildings are damaged, and how the surrounding environment changed. No? And uh, we will come up with a numerical value corresponding to the overall uh, effect to those, uh, no, to those elements. No? So normally, a lengthy interview is done to de determine this non-numerical uh, rating. However, with intensity meters, all we need is to install a device, and that device will do the calculation for that number based on the records of the ground shaking. So what you see here is, uh, is the, uh, what an intensity meter would look like. It will have its... Uh, an accelerometer, uh, which is attached to the ground, and there are digital recorders and a, a processor that will evaluate the intensity rating. We will also have a, a display of the intensity and an enclosure so that it will be protected. No? And uh, there is also a data transmission unit. So the data transmission unit will transmit the, that value to our, uh, to our station here in, in uh, UP. No? So right now the network uh, is about 116 monitoring sites and we can uh, visualize all of the intensity readings and uh, give us a uh, report of the state of health of each of the stations. So what you see here is an image of, of, uh, of inverted triangles. Those inverted triangles are all of the intensity meters uh, currently installed all over the Philippines. And these are some of the places where they are installed. Mostly they are located in, our, in uh, the disaster risk reduction management offices where they are used as reference by the, the dream officers. No? So all of the circles here represent earthquakes that have felt intensities and are recorded by our intensity meter. So aside from our intensity meter, we also have a network of strong motion accelerographs. They are installed in areas very close to the earthquake sources. So once you are very close to the earthquake sources, normally the ground shaking is too large. No? So they are no, so most of the records of uh, uh, our usual instruments, they go off scale and they may not be used for the, the typical research and for uh, engineering design. However, with strong motion instruments, uh, these instruments can feed record uh, large earthquakes even at close range and can be used for various applications, especially by civil engineers when they try to design uh, uh, buildings in, in different areas. So a strong motion station will consist of a, a vault and also the same set of uh, instruments. You have, a, you have a sensor, but instead of a, a, a seismometer, you have an, a triaction triaxial accelerometer, and also a timing system and a dig digital recorder. So right now we have around 100 stations. And this is just a photo of uh, where the, uh, uh, what our typical vault would look like. Uh, it's just really very small and it's normally located in a population center. So just to give you an example of how the network performed during the April 2019 uh, magnitude 6.1 earthquake. Uh, hopefully this was felt uh, uh, by you at that time. No? So uh, this was around 5.11 uh, 5 p.m. Siguro pa time na yon. And the location of the epicenter was in Castillejos. So uh, immediately our automatic system was able to uh, locate the earthquake event in that area. And we also have a uh, a software that would compute for the the intensities, the, uh, sim simulated intensities very close to the epicenter. This will be discussed later by our presenter about REDAS. No? So we are not only ingesting data coming from the network, from the national network, we are also getting data coming from the international global seismological uh, network. So uh, the image on the left side shows you the the intensity ratings by our intensity meters that uh, was able to record and process the, the data. And also the image on the right side shows you the, the different uh, ground shaking uh, waveform that was recorded by our strong motion accelerographs. So as you can see, depending on the location of the 
the accelerator graph, the ground motion would vary. So normally there, uh, the, the ground shaking would be high, very close to the epicenter, but also maybe uh, ex uh, would extend longer if they are located in a very soft and un uh, uh, unconsolidated uh, uh, soil no? so uh, they tend to extend uh, the ground shaking further so uh, we have another program uh, that uh, supports the monitoring of tsunami events so we call this the national tsunami uh, monitoring and early warning so uh, with this, uh, it tackles the improvement of our strategies for end-to-end -end tsunami warning, especially for tsunami-prone coastlines, coastlines in the Philippines. So uh, we do understand that tsunami events can be generated by various geological processes. No? So a large number of tsunami events are actually generated by earthquakes. So this program's this uh, program builds on the information provided by the previous program that I mentioned a while ago. No? So the National Earthquake Monitoring and Information. So however, with the NTMU, we add the sea level monitoring stations to verify if there are significant changes in the height of the seas so that we can confidently issue the appropriate tsunami product. So whether that product will be a warning, an advisory, or just merely an information product. So uh, this shows you that uh, typical uh, decision support tools that uh, would aid us in coming up with the, the product correctly. You know? So uh, once we receive the information from the from our earthquake analyst, we input it in our tsunami scenario database, and this will um, come up with a, a scenario very close to the to the uh, a tsunami scenario that may be very close to the. Uh, tsunami, tsunami that may be generated by the earthquake. So this will produce colored circles indicating what would be the height of the, uh, the tsunami wave that is generated and also what is the arrival time, the first, uh, the arrival time of the first wave. No? So that will indicate what would be, uh, which areas will be impacted first by the tsunami wave. So the scenario database is around 30,000 scenarios. They were based on numerical simulations as shown in this uh, animation here. And uh, uh, normally we put uh, selected forecast points along the coastlines and that will serve as the uh, points where we will refer to just in case a tsunami is generated. Okay, so the, the type of uh, information product would actually depend on the, what would be the, the height of the tsunami wave. If we think that the wave height is around one meter or above, we will issue a tsunami warning immediately. However, if uh, we think it is less than one meter, if a wave is actually generated and it is less than one meter, we would only advise for sea level monitoring uh, and uh, you are advised to just uh, stay away from the beach. However, if we don't think that uh, no threat is, uh, uh, possible, we will issue a no tsunami threat advisory and just uh, give you the information about the earthquake. So just as an example, uh, we had an earthquake back in 2017. It was a magnitude 7.2. And uh, we used that information to determine what would be the expected wave five in the area. And when we saw that the wave is not actually one meter, we issued the uh, uh, sorry, we issued an appropriate, uh, 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 when we were not yet sure whether the, the, the earthquake would generate a wave or not, uh, we issued a sea level monitoring advisory first. But when we received data from our wave uh, sea level stations, we were able to determine that it, that it will not be able to determine, uh, create a very large one meter wave. So we issued a, a sea level disturbance initially, and then we cancel that threat because we are not expecting any uh, disastrous waves coming from this, from this event. So uh, normally we would also issue a, a tsunami monitoring warning and advisory for events located outside the Philippines. No? So there are local events that are generated by local, locally, uh, locally generated tsunamis by the earthquake uh, generators near the Philippines. But there are also uh, tsunami events that can propagate as far as Chile and can reach the Philippines. Sometime in 1960, uh, uh, an, uh, the 
largest instrumentally recorded earthquake, which is a magnitude 9.5. 9.5 was generated in Chile and uh, it generated a tsunami and the waves propagated nearly one day towards the Philippines. No? So uh, hopefully that 24 hour period would have uh, would have been ample time for us to issue a warning but at that time there was no warning system yet. No? So uh, some people died uh, from the Philippines when the waves hit, uh, hit the, uh, near the coastlines of, uh, of Quezon. So, uh, however, we are not alone in, in providing tsunami information. There are other service providers coming from the different uh, regions that, uh, that monitor tsunamis. So, uh, the Pacific Tsunami Warning Center is are currently the watchdog for all of the Philippines. But later on, they started divesting most of their monitoring work with the different centers located in different parts in the Pacific. No? So, for the... Uh, West Philippine Seaside, the South China Sea Tsunami Advisory Center would provide uh, additional information to us. No? So that, that additional super uh, uh, information com coming from the centers and organizations uh, have to be timed correctly so that there will be no confusion uh, once we receive that information. No? So the advisories are mostly text products that would provide information about the event, but also uh, provide us with forecasts of what would be the wave height expected in uh, expected in certain key zones in the in the Philippines no, per, uh, or countries that may be affected and uh, uh, they are timed uh, they are timed uh, appropriately so that there is no confusion in which product to uh, to refer to uh, just in case uh, the the tsunami generator is outside the range of the Philippines. No? So uh, if it's outside the range of the Philippines and it's way beyond and it's located in, for example, South America, uh, PT the PTWC will be the one issuing the first information. And later on, uh, JMA will start to provide additional information if it uh, enters their zone area of re responsibility. Uh, it's not only in text form, but they also provide us with graphical products that will also indicate the uh, tsunami wave amplitude and also the uh, uh, arrival times. No? So uh, this will also help us in determining which areas uh, will be affected and uh, what kind of earthquake information will be issued. So uh, with this type of setup, it's, it's very important that standard operating procedures are in place. No? So once they are in place, they are normally tested through exercises and drills. No? So those exercises are either uh, done in like, for example, communication tests to assure us that the information flow is uh, not impeded uh, across all of the stakeholders that are doing uh, tsunami, tsunami warning. Uh, also, we do uh, earthquake drills. So there was a virtual drill uh, done regularly right now, uh, simultaneous with the National Simultaneous Earthquake Drill. And uh, previously, there was a planned drill by MMDA uh, for Ardex 2020, but this was postponed uh, because of the pandemic. Um, uh, in terms of uh, tsunami warning, it is also important to educate the public being warned, no? so so that they will know what would be the uh, what would they do just in case they receive the information coming from the warning uh, institute. No? So, so uh, it's, uh, we have another strategic program, the Volcano Earthquake and Tsunami Disaster Preparedness and Risk Reduction, which uh, comes up with projects and activities that connects our scientific outputs with our immediate stakeholders and importantly the public in helping the development of policies and activities that would improve uh, preparedness and uh, mitigate the immediate risk. Now, so they would come up with uh, comics, markers, uh, plans. Now, so they would come up with uh, uh, public sector uh, uh, continuity plans and also the uh, evacuation plans. No? So uh, these are they work in hand uh, hand in hand with the with the public so that they can become more resilient uh, just in case there are earthquake and tsunami events. Uh, so they also produce uh, a lot of uh, brochures and uh, uh, videos that may be accessed uh, that will give you information to uh, aid you in. Uh, Inform, informing the public and also your staff. 
Uh, normally, we would also uh, improve the capacities and competencies of our staff. No? So uh, it is important that uh, they are technically competent in instituting all of the operations and uh, monitoring work that is being done in the centers. No? So aside from the regular center, uh, regular center exercises and drills that are performed, uh, they also go through the standard operating procedures, they will look at any loopholes and they will update this if this is necessary. No? So uh, try to understand that uh, tsunami events are actually rare events. No? So uh, as I mentioned a while ago, uh, the statistics would be one event every 10 years. So we rely on numerical simulation uh, to only show what are the potential effects of a tsunami to the coastlines of the Philippines. So that's why we need to always update our, our competencies in terms of numerical modeling of tsunami events. Uh, this is just an image of our cooperation with uh, the, the different universities that are doing uh, uh, tsunami simulation, both in the Philippines and Japan. Uh, in terms of way forward, we have done, uh, we plan to do uh, submarine observ observation system laid, uh, which will be laid down in the Manila Trench. This is a, a, an earthquake generator located on the uh, western side of the northern Luzon, which connects to Taiwan. No? So Taiwan will provide us with the uh, instrumentation backbone. What we need to do is just uh, establish a, uh, a vault in a center uh, where the, the, the cable will come out. No? So this is a, a submarine cable that will stretch from Taiwan down to uh, uh, central Luzon. No? So what we see here are photos of the instruments that will be placed under the ocean. So one, one, there are, will be a seismograph that will be located in the in the trenches, but there is also a pressure gauge that is that will measure the 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 pressure exerted by the sea. This this will indicate what will be the wave height that is passing over this uh, the instrument that is placed along the along the uh, trenches. So that will also give us a. Uh, uh, more time, ample time to further warn the public once we've verified from the pressure gauges that a uh, tsunami wave was generated. Uh, we also plan to do a, a, an experimental earthquake early warning system for a selected area, part particularly Metro Manila. So uh, uh, what, uh, what this earthquake early warning system hinges on is the fact that uh, tsunami waves, the initial tsunami waves are not really small, no, are not really big yet. So uh, the initial waves are actually small and uh, using information from the small, uh, small amplitude waves and hinging on the, uh, the speed of the inf information infrastructure, we would be able to provide the information that uh, an incoming wave, which is of uh, higher amplitude is uh, arriving in the, in the city. So uh, this will be issued in the form of uh, either a text message or a, a ticker tape uh, information in, the, in television networks. No? So um, this will uh, give people ample time to perform safety proce procedures like dock cover and hold, and also uh, building systems such as elevators to uh, stop the operation of buildings, uh, operation of building elevators. No? And uh, oh, this could also be used as an automatic, uh, uh, this can be used to uh, stop uh, uh, operations of, uh, of uh, train systems or power systems and also uh, machinery in uh, manufacturing uh, buildings so that uh, they will not be uh, damaged or they will not cause additional uh, casualties just in case the larger waves would hit the, the area. So that ends my lecture. I hope you were able to pick up something about our, our efforts in terms of monitoring. Maraming salamat po. Thank you very much, Ishma uh, Narag. Um, siya po ang ating uh, OIC, ng Seismological Observation and Earthquake Prediction Division. Kung may questions po tayo, please post po sa ating chat box so that uh, later on we can read kung ano man po. Uh, we have to proceed. Um, we still have two more presentations. And uh, ito pong susunod, I think uh, naririnig nyo na rin, uh, ito po ay tungkol sa isang app um, at in project po na kanilang ginawa. Ang lead po niyan ay itong next speaker natin, 
Uh, siya po ay uh, also a geologist and she has a Master's of Natural Hazards and Disasters from the Australian National University. Uh, she's now supervising science research specialist and lead ng Geo Risk PH, yung malaking project po natin na nabanggit kanina ni Yusek. Let us all welcome Miss Madeline Kahulugan. Madeline? Hello, good morning po uh, sa lahat. Um, a while ago, just this morning, Secretary De La Peña and Yusek Sulidum already mentioned about Hazard Hunter PH. Um, in this presentation, I will be talking about other applications developed by Jiris Philippines, which is the umbrella uh, program of um, more applications, web and as well as mobile applications, and including the integrated database system. So as an outline of the presentation, I will be talking what Jiris Philippines is, the different platforms, salient features of the platforms, and as well as uh, ways forward. So we hear about GRIS Philippines or GRIS PH, but what exactly is it? We can actually describe GRIS Philippines in two ways. Um, it is a governance platform where in different sectors of the society um, talk to each other and share information as well as agree on uh, methods to employ to optimize the use of data in the integrated database system. So that's um, for data governance and for good governance. So that's one, we can um, identify it as a governance platform. The other one is um, we could actually also identify it as an ICT or a geospatial platform wherein we talk about uh, mobile applications, web applications, as well as databases for um, research and development and as well as for hazards and risk assessment, among other um, initiatives that may be derived from those tools. So the vision of GRIS Philippines is really to be a, the a country central source of information for hazard and risk assessment. We know that nowadays data is actually a resource, but we need to um, put all those data in a platform wherein they can be easily accessed and as well as um, they can be managed and um, be analyzed for um, further um, evaluations of risks and um, DRR related concerns. So um, Juris Philippines would want to help the government to increase its resilience against natural hazards. Um, the initiative where uh, collaborations among different government agencies actually started more than a decade ago. In 2005, we had uh, the RENA project and this, is, uh, this was participated by different government agencies involved in mapping hazards. So we have um, PBOTS, we have PAGASA and MGB, as well as um, OCD and Dambria um, as um, part of this, representing the national government. And we went to um, uh, Real, Infanta, and General Nakar in Quezon to map um, hazards and as well as um, communicate you know, the, the risk involved. Then in 2006 to 2013, we had the READY project Again, the key government agencies went to different provinces, now nationwide, no selected uh, provinces in the Philippines, to um, replicate the methods used in the RENA project. Then in 2010 to 2014, we focused in the GMMA area, now um, elevating to um, risk assessment and as well as some um, more in-depth in -depth, um, R&D. Then in 2007, we had... Um, the CCOP and as well as the German government uh, train the national government agencies involved in those uh, previously mentioned projects, specifically in spatial planning, where um, it was emphasized in, in the um, said um, workshop that it is important for us to uh, be able already to develop a national database system and standard codes so that we could sustain the efforts already um, done in the past. So um, since we were all there, uh, the national government, we um, agreed to submit a proposal for G-Risk Philippines, and that happened in 2018. So as you noticed, um, in 2018 for GRIS Philippines, this is composed of all Filipinos and as well as 
um, supported by the government itself, DOSD. So we are very thankful for DOSD for supporting the said initiative. So this is what we did for the data uh, for the database system. First, we cleansed the data in 2018, and then we put standard codes, and um, we developed 16-digit numeric codes wherein all information that may be um, involved or that may be needed for risk assessment may be put in. So, for example, for rehabilitation plans like what NEDA um, needs, um, they would actually want to. Um, get information for infrastructure and housing. So in the data standards that GRISC Philippines developed, we can put that in um, thematic area number three under exposure. So let me show you how. So for example, this is the 16 digit numeric code for that particular um, information in the database system. So this is the code. And you would see here in the map, the location of uh, the specific uh, code. So um, for this specific polygon, now this green polygon, it is a commercial building, specifically a bake shop that has concrete hollow blocks as it, its building materials. So there are a lot of um, other information that can be added in the data code. So as early as 2018, we were already able to develop the integrated database system. So as you could see here, the different um, agencies involved and as well as their information into the servers and databases of GRS Philippines. And in 2018 also, we developed prototypes already of the different web applications that would prove the benefit of having the integrated system. And so that we could also um, get value out of the system immediately. So hence, we were able to um, developed the prototype of Hazard Hunter PH and as well as the Geoanalytics PH. Now in 2019, having all the data codes in place and as well as the integrated database system, together with the prototype um, applications, specifically the Hazard Hunter PH, we were able to present the initiative. So Secretary De La Peña and Yusek Solidium already presented this to the cabinet and the president. And it was actually, um, uh, as a matter of fact, there was already a directive released for agencies to use the platforms of GeoRisk Philippines for their hazards and risk assessment initiatives. So let me now give you some of the salient features of the different hazards and risk assessment platforms that currently are um, available um, under GRS Philippines. So we have Hazard Hunter PH and Geoanalytics PH, the two front end applications that may be accessed freely by the public. We also have um, GeoMapper PH, which um, exists uh, in two um, format. We have the exposure data mapper and the situation data mapper. Basically, these are um, collector tool and reporting tool as well that are governed by credentials. So meaning um, if you want to access information through this application, you need to have um, usernames and passwords. So let not, let's um, proceed to Hazard Hunter PH. Uh, Hazard Hunter PH is available on the web by uh, typing this URL. And now it's also already available in uh, mobile, um, specifically for Android users. So you can download it in Google Play Store. So this was um, shown by Yusek Solidum earlier, but let me um, give you, a, again, a summary of the hazard assessment. This is not just um, FIVOLTS related assessment, but as well as um, assessment coming from Pagasa and assessment coming from MGB. So if you notice, we have here um, options for entering location. So if you're not sure where you are or, or the area, but you know the address, you can input it using the Google search bar. So you just type here Senate building and it will um, direct you to this place. But if you want to um, assess your current location and you have a strong internet connection and your GPS is working well in your mobile, then you can just click here, current location. If you also know the longitude and latitude of the area, you can input those parameters. So if you double click this, Senate building, um, automatically uh, a multi-hazard assessment will be shown you. 
here you see the dark blue line showing you the distance from the nearest active fault. And in this case, uh, the nearest active fault from the building is the West Valley Fault, which is eight kilometers. And you're also 59 kilometers from Taal Volcano. So those are sources, possible sources of hazards, but the hazard assessment is shown here. So there are different types of hazards, again, uh, for, for seismic hazards, volcanic hazards, and hydromet hazards. Um, if you click the map layers uh, located at the leftmost panel of the interface, you will actually be able to see on the map what those um, tsunami uh, polygons look like. So for example, we have um, tsunami here and the colors indicate the wave heights of the tsunami. So here is the Senate building and this one also shows us um, the liquefaction hazard map. Similarly, if you um, want to turn on the layer for flood from the uh, Mines and Geosciences Bureau, you would also be able to see that uh, the Senate building is colored, meaning um, the, the area is susceptible to floods. And this is for um, storm surge and for severe wind from Bagasa. Now, if you would click on the explanation and recommendation button, it's the green button below the summary report, you will be able to generate PDF um, files of the um, reports or of the assessment. So if you see here the QR code, you just need a QR code scanner and then you will be directed again to this coordinates and it will give you the um, assessments. And um, we have here the different uh, government agencies involved um, in producing the information um, and, and having those um, information calculated by the system. And we see here red texts, meaning um, these are areas that are prone to that specific hazards and explanations and recommendations also may be found um, in the report. This is for volcanic hazards assessment and this is for hydrometeorologic hazards assessment from the mines and geosciences view. You see here the logo of MGB. You also see here um, Pagasa's logo um, stipulating that they own the data that were processed by the system. Okay, in addition to uh, performing multi hazard assessment, Hazard Hunter PH now also is able to display the location of uh, safe open spaces against earthquake hazards. So you would see here, um, as processed by Namria and validated by um, the LGUs, and as well as verified Yuma hazard assessment, but verified by FIVOX, we have here these polygons. Not to indicate safe open spaces against earthquakes. So if we zoom in, you would see here again, this is the Senate building. And since um, earlier we did multi-hazard assessment and there are um, hazards not related to earthquakes that the building is prone to. So therefore, uh, malayo po ang mga identified open, safe open spaces. So given the worst case scenario. Um, and uh, other parameters that were um, included in the analysis. Okay, so this also is uh, another feature of a Hazard Hunter PH that you can use easily. Um, for, for volcanic hazard assessment, you will be able to identify the schools that may be uh, prone to specific volcanic hazards. Um, by just a click or in, in, in do, doing this in a few seconds, depending on your internet connection, of course. So we have here an example for Mayon Volcano and we chose Lahar. Immediately, the system is able to give you the approximate number of people that may be affected by Lahar, the number of barangays, schools, since we have DepEd as our partner agency here. So they already submitted school locations and as well as DOH health facility locations. So immediately, this can be calculated and you will also be able to get PDF versions and as well as Excel um, versions of the report. Additionally, um, Hazard Hunter PH, since we already have the different information in one platform. So this is the beauty of having um, all the information in one platform and uh, allowing technology to work, not to automate um, calculations. 
So um, since we already have um, hazard generators, we have active faults here and we have um, active volcanoes. We also have information from other government agencies like DepEd and DOH. And we um, also have um, location of um, earthquakes. We can actually do hazard assessment, quick hazard assessment on our own by just use, using this map and as well as um, filtering some of the information to give you specific um, answers to your queries. Um, hazard Hunter PH can also be used to download hazard map layouts. Now, if you want to um, explore on the methods really used to um, generate the hazard maps, the parameters used, you can go to the hazard map uh, feature. So download hazard map feature and then you just need to select the location that you would want to access. And then for example here I chose liquefaction so you can download this map for free. Um, just last year we were also able to display the um, gener uh, the satellite image interpretation based on AI processing of DOSD as D. So they um, provided us the results of their AI analysis and gave us this flood situation maps in Cagayan Valley, which may actually be used by um, responders, by OCD. So that's it for Hazard Hunter PH. Now let's proceed to Geoanalytics PH, another application of um, GRS Philippines. So Geoanalytics PH, can actually um, produce these kinds of maps and as well as these kinds of graphs and analysis. So you just need to know what you want to um, what you want to extract from the database so that um, it can give you specific list and as well as charts. So as a highlight, we are also able to um, display here demographic analysis showing us the age range and as well as if um, it's male or female that would be affected by particular hazards. So here in this figure, you see tsunami hazard in Manila City and the number of uh, male that may be affected and with specific age range. This is an example of an LGU that used the geoanalytics platform to um, for, for their DRR uh, M plan. Okay, so they attach uh, results from Geoanalytics PH in their document. Let's proceed to GeoMapper PH. So this is the third application under uh, GeoRisk Philippines. And this is how the system works. And as what I said earlier, this is governed by username and password. So basically, um, the the platform may be used um, using tablets or mobile phones and your desktops, and it is governed by APIs. Then the different platforms may consume the information through APIs. Let me show you a template of how this is used by um, the local government unit. So this is Cebu City, and we're working with Redas, as you see here, the log of Redas. Um, the buildings are already color coded, the building footprints, and this shows us the type of construction materials used by the different buildings. Now, if building footprint information is not available, it's not provided by NAMRIA, then we can actually um, digitize uh, the buildings and input the, in the data for, for that specific building. Collaborations um, with the Department of Agriculture, particularly the Bureau of Animal and Indus Industry and Food Agriculture Organization. Now they plotted the farm lots in um, Taal or around Taal Volcano. And this is how the dashboard looks like. We also have um, information from the ICT showing us cell site towers. And all of this, they are contributing for multi hazard assessments. So these are results of um, information per region or, or the hazard assessment per region. DTI also submitted information for MSMEs and they are able to access this uh, dashboard and see the results of um, assessments from different government agencies in relation to the location of their MSMEs. 
And so we are also um, encouraging other government agencies to collaborate with us so that they would um, be able to access the hazards information from the system. And um, situation data mapper is a module of GeoMapper PH, which um, can be used to report specific um, situations on the ground during um, earthquakes or during typhoons. So this was during uh, Typhoon Ulysses. Okay, as a way forward, um, we want to integrate more the different platforms. So if you noticed, we have I have mentioned three platforms already, the Hazard Hunter, Geoanalytics, and Geomapper. So what we want to do in the future is for us to um, allow users to have um, users user credentials. And depending on the roles and their credentials, they can access uh, more information and more advanced features of the platforms. So for example, if um, a person or an institution registers, then they can access advanced features and as well as they can analyze and use specific um, platform or application, for example, geoanalytics and um, draw from the database their uh, specific uh, information for analysis. Okay, as a summary, GIRS Philippines is a multi-agency initiative and it's being led by DOST peoples. Um, it can be considered as a governance platform and as well as an ICT platform. It has three ICT platforms, the GeoMapper, GeoAnalytics, and Hazard Hunter. And specifically, they can perform um, functions pre and post disaster um, events. And then baseline data may be collected by GeoMapper and may be analyzed um, for free you know, by the public using Hazard Hunter and GeoAnalytics. So this ends the presentation. Thank you so much. Okay, hey, thank you very much, Mavi, for a very, very detailed presentation about Juris. So sa mga interested po, downloadable po siya and you can access. So one last uh, topic, uh, we're running kind of like malapit na sa lunch, but I hope you wait kasi Redas is a very interesting topic. And ang naggawa po nito ay, uh, of course, ang scientists po natin dito sa FIVOX. And uh, we are very proud to uh, present to you ang kanila pong long years of hard work. Uh, our next speaker, uh, she's also a licensed geologist and she also received her uh, degree in geology from UP, Diliman, and her Master of Science in Earth and Planetary Sciences from Kyoto University in Japan, and her PhD as well, her Doctor of Science in Earth and Planetary Sciences. And she's actually an associate scientist and Reda's program coordinator, together with the uh, former deputy director, Bartolome Bautista, who just recently retired. Let us all welcome Dr. Maria Leonila P. Bautista. Leo? Okay, thank you, Marilyn. Uh, good morning, everyone. I will be sharing my screen. Okay. Uh, na? Okay. So good morning, almost good noon na po everyone. I will be talking about uh, the FIVOX Rapid Earthquake Damage Assessment System software. Um, I'm Leia Bautista from FIVOX DOST. Uh, the idea of developing the Reda software was born more than 30 years ago when we had a big earthquake in Northern Luzon and uh, it was a magnitude 7.8 and the statistics are shown in this uh, uh, slide. Uh, there are so many people who died, a lot of people injured, and so many buildings collapse. So a typical situation when a large magnitude earthquake occurs is that there's a breakdown of communication facilities. <clears throat> there's a disruption of power supply, and some places are isolated because of collapse of bridges and the fate of roads. And therefore, even if you wanted to do some rescue and relief operations, we do not know where to go, okay? So a main lesson learned for us for FIVOLS was the need to develop a tool <clears throat> like a rapid earthquake damage assessment system that right away can tell us where to go, where are the possible seismic hazards, and how severe the impacts to the population and other elements at risk. So we developed this REDAS. We started with REDAS 1.0 under a DOST project in 2002. Uh, and then uh, it, is, it is a hazard simulation software that aims to produce hazard and risk maps immediately after the occurrence of a strong and potentially damaging earthquake. 
So um, from since 2006 to present, we have been distributing the software free of charge. And whenever we have a MOA with a particular stakeholder like LGU, they may use it for their land use planning and emergency preparedness. Uh, once we say yes to a particular LGU, our support includes technology transfer, the hands-on training, and technical support. So now I'll be introducing the capabilities of REDAS. The first is REDAS as a monitoring tool. So in REDAS, there is a tool or a module called ETAM, or Earthquake Tsunami Alerting Module, wherein we are able to provide near real-time earthquake and data information. So the, the data, the the user can access PVOX uh, server or the network of PVOX data, as well as USGS and the RIMES, which is located in Thailand. So they have choices of information. And they can also sort data according to the magnitude. They can sort the small earthquakes like magnitude zero or the moderate magnitude or the big ones, which are, which are magnitude 6.5. No? And they, they can set it to for them to receive SMS and email access when these particular earthquakes occur. Uh, this is an example of uh, the, the earthquakes plotted using the REDAS ETAM. The map on the left shows the smaller earthquakes, the magnitude zero and above, while the, the map on the right shows the bigger ones, which are the magnitudes four and above. Okay? So another module of REDAS is the intensity reporting. So the table, the box on the right, is the, are the boxes or the drop down menu that the users can fill in. And right away, uh, the intensities are reported to the FIVOX server. And it, the results can be plotted on Google Maps like this, the map on uh, below. And the push pins displays uh, the intensity depending on the intensity. Uh, the colors denotes the intensities of the earthquake. Okay, And you can further zoom in to locate where the um, observer is located, okay? Another module is the Satellite Rainfall Monitor, or SRM. This was developed only last year because precisely rain gauges are expensive. They are hard to acquire, to install, and even maintain. So we developed this wherein uh, the users are able to install virtual rain gauges anywhere they want in the Philippines, and therefore they can infer rainfall values. And SRM is useful for lahars, earthquake-induced landslide monitoring, floods and landslide monitoring in LGU operation centers. So this is an example of a SRM in rainfall data monitoring mode. Uh, um, by looking at the map on the right, the LGU of the, or the observer can monitor uh, the amount of rainfall that's happening and how it um, enters their areas of responsibility. Uh, the graph on the left, uh, they can also graph or plot these uh, results in a table format and um, graph format so they can visualize and uh, use this for their early warning system. So another feature of REDAS is, is as a data exposure data collection tool. So uh, exposure is uh, the elements at risk that we are gathering via our stakeholders, especially LGUs. So we use this for disaster impact and loss simulation, emergency and contingency planning, land use and development plans, and local government business activities. So we have Redis is teamed up with GeoMapper or the GeoRisk PH. And uh, instead of point data, we are collect collecting data with polygon geometry. And the uh, attributes that we are collecting are usable for multi hazard impact assessment and data merging is done by sending data to the server via the internet and what the LGU can do is they can pull back the data using a web application and this application is available for Android and iOS and then the data can again be exported as CSV or Excel and viewed in GIS and it is also linked to the FIVOX Hazard Hunter. Okay. So, and then uh, the other feature of REDAS is as an impact assessment tool. This is the more exciting part because in this part, we can compute the physical damage, the fatalities, injuries, and economic loss, as well as agricultural damage. And the results can be in table format, GIS shapefile, or REDAS plot file. So there are already five impact assessment modules in REDAS. First is the shake or the earthquake shaking. Uh, the second is for severe wind, we call it SWIFT. Uh, the third is SUSIM, we call it, this is for the tsunami. 
And the fourth is float. This is the one for flood. And the fifth is crop dot. This is for the crop damage or agricultural damage. Uh, so to do this, we have put together several uh, data in REDAS to do the impact calculation. We, do, we teach the LGUs to, to do the simulation themselves in terms of hazard. And then the exposure data is either is a built-in data that we develop with them or for them. And uh, the third is the vulnerability equation, which are the equations which tells us that, for example, if it's intensity 7, 8, or 9, then how much percent will a particular damage, will a particular building incur in, ter in terms of damage. So these types of equations are already embedded in REDAS, so we are able to do the impact calculations. So, for example, for tsunami, which we call TUSIM, we can uh, generate tsunami simulation. We teach the LGUs to do this, including the inundation maps. And, uh, for example, we can teach them to do the simulation during trainings like this. Uh, they will know how far or what time the tsunami will happen in their particular locality, and they can zoom in as well. And after this, we are teaching them to compute for the impacts, like um, for this particular area, they were able to develop the exposure database and we were able to compute the damage from zero to three, three being the most damaging, and they, they are able to compute for the affected population and the number of buildings. And the results are color-coded when plotted on the map. So this is the tsunami impact uh, simulation module of REDAS. And using this in, in tandem with the ETA module, uh, the LGU or the user can also plot the hazard map on Google Earth. And then using this, they can plot also the community-based evacuation site by plotting the routes as well as putting, knowing where to put the signages since they know where the hazard is located, then they can um, plan how they will develop their uh, evacuation routes as well as uh, how many the timing of their uh, practice when they do the drills okay so the other module uh, is the float or the flood loss assessment tool that we've co-developed with mgb mines and geosciences bureau uh, in this module we compute for the loss due to flood so we can compute for the physical damage like so the damage of floor area and the cost and the number of buildings and then we can also compute the population the number of population uh, and this aggregated into male female disabled senior citizen and children as well as the people with inundated shelters needing evacuation okay and then we can plot the results into map form like this like the number of damaged buildings the cost as well as the population uh, this aggregated into different parameters like children, disabled, female, and senior citizen. Why do we need to do this? Because in the evacuation centers, each of this uh, type of people will be needing different types of assistance in these evacuation centers. Okay. So the other module of impact assessment is SWIFT, or this is for computing the impacts due to severe wind. And this is we co developed with PAGASA. Uh, first, we teach the LGU to develop or simulate their wind field map using the uh, typhoon tracks provided by Pagasa, and then we develop the severe wind hazard map. And then we are able, since they have exposure database and fragility curves in Redas, uh, we can also compute for the damaged buildings. My example is Cavite Province during the occurrence of Typhoon Glenda. This is the map, an impact map. And the darker colors will indicate the more severe damage for these particular barangays of Cavite City. Okay? And then we can also plot the economic loss for this particular scenario. And then we can plot the affected population in Cavite province during this particular Glenda scenario. This aggregated into children, male, female, senior citizen, and PWD, including the household count. And then we can tabulate the results as well. So the top notcher for this particular scenario will be Bacor, a 4,500 complete damage structure, followed by Las Marinas, 1,700, and Tansa, 1,700, for a total of 21 uh, thousand structures possibly damaged for this particular scenario, okay? And then the other module of REDAS is crop dot, which is uh, the damage due to crops, in particular rice and corn. And we are computing the damage caused by severe wind and flood. This was co-developed by SUC, with SUCs, um, Marina, Mariano Marcos State University, also under a shared DOST project. 
So let's see some results. So here I uh, we simulated a magnitude 7.2 earthquake along the West Valley Fault. So first we generate a, a map like this in Redas uh, intensity map. Uh, showing the different colors. The, the red one will be the most severe intensity, intensity 8. And then we're able, since we have exposure database and fragility curves, we're able to plot the economic loss map for a particular city. In this case, I chose Pantelo UCT. So this is the map uh, plotted on red. As the darker colors will indicate the more severity of impacts for economic loss. The results can also be plotted on Google Earth, like so, the map on the right. Okay. And then we can also plot the damage levels, the physical damage. Uh, the minimum will be D1 and the worst is D5. Okay, let's see some pictures. The, the middle will be D3, which is extensive damage, wherein cracks and falling are observed in columns, like so. And we can plot the D3 for this particular scenario like this, for Bandalo Yung City. Uh, the red lines will be the location of the uh, fault, the valley fault, and the star will be the location of the epicenter. The darker colors will indicate the more severity of damage for D3. And for D4, which will look like this, uh, heavily damaged supports, but the building remains standing, okay, like so. We can plot also the results, like the one on the, the map on the right, okay. And then for D5, which is complete damage with collapse, com all columns and walls are flattened to the ground. We can plot the results like so for Mandalo UCP for this particular scenario, okay? So then we can also compute for the casualty level. How many people will have slight injuries, non-life-threatening, uh, life-threatening injuries and fatalities? Main shock pa lang po, maari ng mortally injured. So we can do this, we can plot the map like so uh, for Mandalo City for this particular scenario, slight injuries, non-life-threatening, life-threatening and fatalities, okay? And then we can tabulate the results per barangay. This is the summary of results per barangay for Mandalo City. So for a total of 502 potential fatalities for this particular scenario, the top notcher or the highest number will be for addition hills, wherein we are expecting 103 fatalities should there be a magnitude 7.2 earthquake. So when an LG talks to a barangay captain, he or she will have a science-based information to back up the preparation for a particular uh, barangay or even municipality, okay? All results are science-based, okay? So let's see some comparison of results. Uh, in 2019, there was a magnitude 6.2 earthquake in Cotabato. So this is the plot and the bulletin on the left. We simulated using REDAS, okay? And since we have exposure database of Cotabato City derived from PSA data and we have the fragility curves, uh, let us compare the results using the NDREMC CITREP. So the CITREP report says that in Cotabato, there were two casualties and 36 injuries uh, divided into different provinces like so. And when we simulated using REDAS, we were able to compute 18 fatalities and this is the number of uh, injuries, okay? So two versus 18, okay? And if we plot the results using the simulation and compare it with the non, um, towns mentioned in the CITREP, we see that uh, Kidapawan, uh, we, sim we, we simulated two fatalities and then Makilala three and Lang three and Tulunan 10. And these are the numbers based on the CITREP reports. So what we're saying is that if we have ahead of time a knowledge about what's going to happen, including the number of casualties, then our preparation are more realistic and they are based on science, okay? So how is Redis shared to stakeholders? So before, before the pandemic, we were doing this like face-to-face -face training, six-day face-to-face training. But during the pandemic, we developed online courses wherein we uh, prepared a Ladi Rice course from module one to nine. So since that time, we have already done a lot of training since the pandemic and even up to now. As I speak, uh, we have on ongoing trainings. Okay? So who are the Redas users? These are the LGUs, the national government agencies, SUCs, church groups, private companies, and NGOs. So to date, we have trained 51 provinces, 612 towns and cities, including 17 government institutions, 32 SUCs, one church group, 72 private companies, and 10 NGOs. Okay. So this is the map of all the, these uh, LGUs that we have trained so far as of October 2020. Uh, now, why why Redis can't be web-based at the moment? 
Uh, Redis hazard simulation requires high-level and intensive computing capabilities, which are difficult to do using centralized system because it will require a very powerful computer such as a supercomputer to accommodate simultaneous usage of many users. So at this point, it's not yet possible. Number two, the best way to do this is to just put all of these input parameters on a server. And what users can do is they can automatically download using Redas. And then what they can do is then do the near real-time simulation of hazards and impacts of recent events whenever this occur. So they do it real-time, okay? So impact results are also dynamic. They change depending on the impact parameters. So it's not static. So every time there's a different earthquake, different magnitude, different depth, then the results will change, okay? So suitable exposure database for comprehensive impact assessment is not readily available. It has to be built and continuously updated by local partners. And of course, we often encounter this, the internet capabilities of our LGUs are sometimes limited. So why do we need to do this? Why do we need to teach stakeholders how to determine their own impact results? Because we want to teach communities to learn by doing. We, have, we want them to do science-based disaster preparedness, to foster self-help and self-reliance, and therefore, if communities understand, therefore, they will accept and own their own impact results. So our goal in using REDAS in emergency preparedness, contingency planning, and mainstreaming disaster risk reduction in the development planning process for safe and prepared Philippine communities. I think that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Bakleo. Um, so we're done with five um, presentations. May I request uh, ating pa mga speakers, uh, if you can please turn on your camera for possible questions from our participants. This is the time to ask questions, lalo na for clarification. Um, yung software developed by uh, Docleo and her group, yung Redas, and also yung Kemabi na Juris. And of course, si Yusek ay nandito pa rin. Um, shall we begin? Um, Naka-open na ba yung mga, naka-on na ba yung mga video nila? Hindi ko makita. Lucy? Okay. I, I saw several questions. I think there are two right now. Uh, questions sa uh, ating chat box. Unahin natin yung first question. Are you ready? Lucy, can you pin yung uh, speakers natin? Okay. okay, this one is really directed to Yusek Solidum uh, from Ms. Tita Suerta Felipe. Uh, Yusek Rene, how safe are PVOX DRR instrument po? I would think that this PVOX equipment installed are expensive and valuable. Are there incidents of pilferage or stealing of these instruments? And are LGUs where these DRR instruments are installed, informed, and are they providing protection for this equipment as well? Sir? Well, in general, the instruments are safe and LGUs know that there are certain sites that we have uh, where we have placed the instruments. However, there are cases where uh, some people would pilfer and uh, get the solar, the batteries, um, and they use it for something else. Uh, we have several apprehensions already. Uh, what is important though is not only the value, which is a little bit expensive than normal instrument, but the data lost. Uh, when there is no operation for a particular sensor. Yeah, so essentially, it is better now than before. But of course, no one can really prevent anyone to do something because the instruments, especially for those in the volcano area, are somewhat isolated. No one can guard this. So what is important is we tell people that these uh, instruments are really for them. The data are used to monitor the volcanoes, the earthquake, tsunami, and essentially, they actually benefit from it. Uh, pero hindi mo maiwasan, meron talagang mga uh, gumagawa ng ganon, but not as frequent uh, as before. 
Okay, I hope nasagot po, ma'am ma Rita, ang inyong question. Now, let's go to the next question. Uh, this one is from Miss Nelia Bustria. Gumalaw, <laughs> sandali. Do you think that there should be permanent relocation programs in LGUs, especially those located in tsunami and earthquake prone areas and are and no built zone areas? It is observed that the LGUs are evacuating their constituents only when there are warnings for impending typhoon, volcanic movements, tsunami. Thanks. Sino po ang gustong sumagot, sir? Ah, walang audio si Yusek. Yeah. We cannot relocate people. We have 14 million people, for example, exposed to tsunami. So you cannot relocate them. For tsunami purposes, what is important is follow the water code where they don't build inside the restriction zone from the uh, seawater level. And then improve their planning, improve their road access, and have a good evacuation planning. You know, uh, tsunami, tsunamis are not as frequent as floods. So that is the approach to tsunami. However, what we need to do though for other hazards like faults, then those on top should be uh, recommended for um, relocation and there must be assistance. Please note that uh, relocation is the usual, usual recommendation to avoid hazards, but there are many other things. And uh, what we need to know is, can we make an area safer from a particular hazard? I think for earthquake, ground shake, and liquefaction, we can, we can have engineering technology to do that. We avoid very areas with very high susceptibility to landslide. Then that can be relocated. For flood events, those at uh, very high risk to flood may be, but there can, also have, uh, there can also be mitigation measure to reduce the amount of flooding. It would need, as always, uh, um, information or warning and uh, evacuation. Um, there is no such place as 100%. But there are a few areas which might be very, very safe. So I think relocation is not the major issue, but making sure that where they settle, um, they are safer and they can evacuate to high grounds. But of course, we need to relocate those at very high risk to certain hazards. Okay, thank you, sir. So it depended in po sa lugar, but most of the time, alam po natin, marami po talaga ang uh, community. Siguro ang, uh, dagdagan ko lang, siguro ang, ang pinaka-importante sa volcano area, yung sa permanent danger zone. Yun ang dapat i-relocate. And then on top of the fault and very high risk areas to landslide. And of course, some areas that are very high risk to flood. But, you know, many places in the Philippines are valleys. So, mahirap mo rin masagot yun through relocation. Okay, so, I guess it has to be very specific. Yung mga very high risk, identified as permanent danger zones and such. So, yun ang sagot natin. And now, let's move on from the OST ITDI, si Michael Jason Solis. I would like I would just like to know where po natin pinapakalibrate or test yung ating complex measuring instrument kasi po yung National Metrology Laboratory is not yet cap capable. Abroad pa ba or local? Ating mga instrument yeah. po. The National Metrology Lab of ITDI cannot calibrate our instruments. We, we, are, we have our own calibration. We're purchasing other uh, instruments to calibrate uh, our instruments. Uh, and sometimes we send it abroad. Maybe Mr. Narag can explain it better for the earthquake uh, instruments because we're purchasing certain instruments for calibration. So right now we are purchasing a calibration table for our sensors. And this is useful for us to understand how we can go back to ground motion values rather than the response of the sensor being recorded by the, the instrument. So anyway, uh, Tamasi, sir, we normally send it abroad and have it calibrated. But uh, recently, we decided to buy our own calibration table. It's a portable calibration table, so we can expect expect what would be the response of the response of the sensor. Basically, what we want to do is to map back to the ground motion values. So, of course, because of uh, no, through time, it will wear and tear. But as long as we have the transfer function, no, uh, no. Uh, that would map out yung, yung values that is recorded to the actual values of ground motion, then we're okay. I guess within tolerable levels. Okay, I hope nasagot ang tanong nyo, sir. 
Um, any other questions? Do we have more questions sa ating mga participants? Wala sa ating mga participants. Um, just a quick reminder po. Uh, ah, salamat din po, sir. Um, okay, sagot lang po yung ating attendance and then there will be a link for uh, the feedback uh, evaluation for this webinar and so that you may receive your um, certificate of attendance after a few a week or so. Um, for our uh, formal closing, we are very, very proud and happy to introduce to you today um, our new deputy director. He also is a geologist and he received his uh, PhD from the University de Paris in France. And uh, please let us all welcome our newly appointed deputy director, Dr. Teresito C. Bacolpol. Okay, um, may I take this opportunity to thank you all for attending uh, today's Volcano and Arctic webinar. Um, for us Filipinos, earthquakes, uh, volcanic eruptions, and typhoons are a fact of life given our geographic and geologic setting. But just because they are inevitable does not mean that there is nothing we can do to mitigate or even eliminate the impacts of these natural calamities. We can certainly reduce the effects of these natural hazards if we understand the processes why they occur. Thankfully, many of our countrymen, whether they are in the government or private sector, are very supportive of the disaster resiliency programs in our country. That uh, you are here uh, despite your busy schedule, ready to uh, listen to what our institute is doing is one proof that the Philippine Senate is very much interested in making sure that Filipinos are safe from natural disasters. Um, indeed, disaster preparedness is not just the business of VVOX, PAGASA, or in the RRMC. It's everyone's business. We all know what happened in Taal and in Masbate last year. There was also a series of typhoons that battered Luzon towards the end of 2020. Events like this underscore the importance of working together and supporting each other to ensure that our people, especially the vulnerable sectors, are always ready and prepared when natural disasters occur. Again, thank you all for attending and for being supportive of FIVOX programs and activities. I hope you learned a lot from today's webinar. Thank you too, sir. Thank you very much, Pa, um, Dr. Bakalpal and Yusek Solidum for staying until the very end. And yan pa po ba si Secretary? Sorry, I couldn't see sa ating participants. And sa lahat po na nag- uh, na nakinig at sana po ay uh, mas naging familiar kayo kung ano po ang ginagawa ng FIVOX lalo na po yung aming mga priority programs and maraming salamat po sa tulong ninyong lahat mula sa Senado para po sa uh, patuloy na pagsuporta po sa DOST FIVOX, sir. Um, maraming maraming salamat po sa inyong lahat. Thank you, DOST FIVOX. Thank you, yeah. thank you. Thank you, Attorney, ha, sa office ni uh, Senator Binay. And please don't forget the evaluation. Importante po yan. Thank you, thank you, Pastor.